Good morning and welcome to the fifth meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. I want to remind everyone present to switch off electronic devices of any description as they may affect the broadcasting system. Uh, can I also welcome Edward Mountain, MSP, to the meeting. Mr Mountain is attending in his capacity as an individual MSP in this instance. Uh, we move to the first item on the agenda which is for the committee to consider whether to take item three in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The second item on the agenda is to take evidence from two panels on the committee's inquiry into the environmental impacts of salmon farming in Scotland. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone present that the focus of the committee's inquiry is on the report commissioned by SPICE and undertaken by SAMS um, into the environmental impacts of salmon farming in Scotland. We will therefore not be discussing any non-environmental issues today. The Committee's report on this work, however, will be considered as part of the Rural Economy and Connectivity's wider inquiry into salmon farming in Scotland. Can I therefore ask all the witnesses who will be uh, giving evidence today to restrict their responses to environmental impacts only? Let me welcome the first panel, John Aitchison, who is a member of the Friends of the Sounds of Jura. Sam Collin, the convener of the Scottish Environment Link Aquaculture Subgroup and a Marine Planning Officer at the Scottish Wildlife Trust, and David Sanderson, General Manager of the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation. Gentlemen, welcome. Um, let's just get right into some questions. Um, can I ask you whether you think the environmental impacts and concerns regarding salmon farming have changed in any way since 2002, or, or are they fundamentally the same? Sam Collin. Hi. Um, I think the, uh, the Sam's report highlights a lot of um, key concerns that we consider very important. Um, but worry, what's worrying for us is the fact that these questions, uh, some of these key questions, we still can't answer. And they were questions that were raised in 2002. So we've got a growing body of evidence that shows that um, the environmental impact, there's a case for an environmental impact on the environment from salmon farming, but we're still lacking enough data to clarify what that impact is. Um, so without answering those, being unable to answer those questions, um, I don't think that we've seen much change in the actual practices of uh, salmon aquaculture. It, David Sanderson. Yes, if I may. Um, thank you. I welcome the opportunity to actually come here and, and, and discuss the report, and it's very, very good that you've taken a, a view that you're looking at that in comparison to where you were with the 2002 report. Um, it's fair to say that the risks associated with the business of salmon farming will be exactly the same risks. They're well quantified, well known risks. The issue that probably comes out of the report is whether or not we understand the impacts of activity, and have we got the right information in Scotland to measure that impact. Um, I think the report is quite reassuring from that point of view insofar as when it looks at the actual analysis of those risks, then it puts most of them in the category of being quite low. And clearly there are one or two that are very, I'm sure they're going to get your focus. They are the risks that are still being dealt with and managed and we're going to have to continue to find the answers that we're still seeking in those, in those areas. And I think that's the important bit that we need to discuss more today. John Aitchison. I can't agree with that, I'm afraid. I think the, the, the problems are the same, but the scale of the problems is much worse. There's been a, an enormous increase in sea lice. There's solid proof that the sea lice affect populations of wild salmonids, including, including sea trout, not just salmon. Um, the pollution aspects are much clearer now than they were before. The pollution of 45 sea locks with industrial chemicals, the chemical use is enormously higher because of the sea lice. It's, it's on a different scale and the impacts are much larger. What about the science and the data that's available to inform policy in this area? How much progress has been made since 2002? How much better is our understanding of the impacts? It says that there's no information on almost every subject when you look in there. There's, there's, every category says it's amazing how little information there is. And one of the big ones is why is there so little information um, from Scotland, which is the excuse for not dealing with sea lice usually, when um, Norway and Ireland and other countries are doing enormous amounts of work on that, and it's not done here. Um, I think it's fair to say that when you look at the issues that face our industry, fish health and the, 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 the aspects of fish health that are most important to success, if you like, in, in, in growing our livestock, is the core of our business. Now, in that regard, um, we understand and acknowledge that there are gaps in, 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 in data. And we could, we could definitely enhance that further. 
So in that regard, I would like to confirm today for the committee's benefit and for the wider public, industry has been chastened for a long time now about supplying information on sea lice numbers in the, in the farms in Scotland. And I can confirm that from here on forthwith, we will be publishing all data associated, associated with sea lice counts on farms on a farm by farm basis in Scotland. This backs up the decision of the industry SSPO board that was taken in November last year and is now in the public domain. Why now? Um, we believe that we need to move the debate forward. Um, we hear all the arguments, we hear all the, 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 the background noise, but we want to have a proper, open, honest dialogue about the actual status of farm sites in Scotland. And if we feel, or if people feel that that data can be of use to the scientific and research community and can move us forward, then fine. Absolutely no problem whatsoever in being completely open and transparent with that data. There's nothing whatsoever that we wish to hide away. Given the concerns that have been expressed previously about how that data might be used, would you be publishing with a time lag? We haven't got to the point of the actual detail. Um, we inevitably have to have some time lag because it takes time to gather and check data before you can actually release it. So I think there's some detail that's under discussion at the moment within the, um, the group that's been formed to look at the fish health framework for Scotland for the next 10 years. And that's a government and industry group with representatives from many regulators on board. And in that group, I believe the detail of how that data should be used and, and, and published will be will be part of the remit. Sam Collin, I think you want to come in. Yes, thank you. Um, first, I'd just like to say it's welcome news that the industry will be publishing these data. Um, but the concern being that um, we would like to see historical data published as well. Um, when we're talking about adaptive management and learning from uh, impacts and data collected, uh, that takes time to collect data, it takes time to monitor, and that will delay any action and any con uh, conclusive results. With the historical data, we can begin with a wealth of data and start making changes now. David Sanson, you're nodding your head. Is that going to be available? I think, I think again, we're very happy to look at what we can provide that would help the debate. Um, there is data there because it's not as if the industry hasn't been gathering and, and, and publishing this data. It's been published in regional format for the last five or six years in quite, quite big detail. So I think we need to look at that data. Data is extremely important. We need to know how to use it for the best advantage of all. Ron Aitchison. Um, this is welcome, but it's been forced by the Information Commissioner enforcing a, a decision which the government um, refused to do, which was to publish this data because the industry said they didn't want to initially. But it's good that it's happening now. But what the, what the um, aggregate data that there's been before has concealed is the, the massive spikes of sea lice in many farms. For instance, one in Shetland has 20 sea lice, adult female sea lice per fish, when um, the threshold for action is eight, and eight's very high. The threshold for action used to be one. So that was the code of good practice threshold for action. So if, if those spikes, those are the ones that are doing the biggest harm, and that information needs to be not just published, but acted on instantly and something done about it, because the billions of sea lice that produced by those farms kill um, sea trout and, and damage um, and kill salmon. Mark Roscoe. Will the industry also be publishing data on salmon mortality broken down by farm with the reasons for those uh, salmon morts as well broken down? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, we, will, we will provide mortality data at farm level and we will give a commentary on any disease issues that may be associated with that mortality from time to time. Will that be historical data as well alongside of the sea lice? Part of the commitment that we've made with the, 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 the Fish Health Framework Group that's sitting looking at the 10-year the strategy is that we're going to provide five years of historical mortality data that will be annualised and it will be comparative year on year. Um, and at the moment, we have that data up to 2015. Clearly, 2016 and 17, we still have to complete the production cycles for those years. Okay. We've into sea lice, and I think we'll, we'll move to that in a second. But before we do that, a question more about the more general direction of travel uh, as a scene setter. Can any of you or all of you point to examples where the growth of the sector has been influenced by the precautionary principle? interesting hearing uh, Professor Verspo when you asked him that question on behalf of that whole panel having reviewed all the scientific evidence that he squirmed around and said there's been a, um, an attempt to work together historically that was it that was the precautionary principle as enunciated to this committee 
that was really poor. There's no, there's none, there's none. It's not been applied. David Sanderson. Uh, there are a plethora of examples. Um, one of them is that there's an arbitrary limit on the scale, the maximum scale of a salmon farm site in Scotland. Um, that's been in place for a long, long time. Um, so the modelled scale of a farm in Scotland can only be a certain size. So that is, is basically because of an element of precaution. Within every consent that's given for the activity on a salmon farm, the environmental quality standard that's used to set that consent <coughs> is set at a very precautionary level. And from that, for that reason alone, there's significant precaution built into the consenting process. Our consenting process in Scotland is world leading. It is, it, we're, we're renowned for having a strong regulatory background for what we do in Scotland. And I think we have to acknowledge that built into that will be an element of precaution. Okay. Sam Collin. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to pick up on the, the 2,500 tonne limit on uh, salmon farms. That's actually a limitation of the depot modern model that's been used. Um, which, so that's why it's been an arbitrary limit. It's not been a precautionary limit. Um, and secondly, the new depot mod model has vastly improved the old model, and therefore this 2,500 tonne limit has now been removed, and we're seeing more uh, interest in much larger farms now. Thank you. And the uh, application has already good. gone in for a 3,500 tonne farm. Okay, thank you. Right, let's, let's address the sea ice data in, in greater detail now. Um, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning to you all. Uh, it, it is indeed a welcome uh, statement that you've made today, David um, Sanderson, about um, the sea lice data. Um, you'll recall, no doubt, that I took through an amendment which didn't actually um, become law um, in the Aquaculture Bill um, about farm-by-farm -farm, uh, reporting. Uh, can you give us more detail, please, um, for the record today about um, what you mean by real-time um, uh, and, and why there would be a delay on that. Could you go into detail on that? And could you also tell us, uh, and then I'd like to move to comments from the rest of the panel as well, uh, about whether um, you see, um, or indeed other panel members see, um, a reason for making this um, a statutory obligation in view of the fact that not all the members, as I understand, not all Salmon Farms are members of your organisation. And, uh, and um, I, I'd like a, a comment on that and also on um, whether there's the opportunity to make sure that um, wild salmon are protected, which I understand at the moment, um, it, it, it's only salmon within the cages that would be affected, which is a broader question than perhaps you can answer. Okay, you've asked me quite a lot there. Um, okay, let, let's look again at, at what we mean when we say we'll publish everything. And I'll explain or paint a picture of what actually happens on farms. Every single salmon farm in Scotland counts its sea lice levels on a weekly basis, and that has to be resourced. It has to be um, properly recorded. That information has to be gathered at, first of all, company level, then it has to be passed on and collectivised. So there's an inevitability that that will take more than a week. And we anticipate, um, and, and subject to agreement with, with, with all parties, including the regulators, we, we would anticipate that we will, we will look at farm by farm, probably on a month by month basis, and clearly there will be some lag in, 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 in the time scale for actually presenting that publicly. It's really difficult for me at this stage to say exactly what that will look like because this is an ongoing discussion, and as I've said already, the, the, the ongoing work with the 10 year. Uh, fish health framework will be the place in which the detail of that will be thrashed out and um, I'm sure that we'll hear more about that probably within the next two months because that group is due to report in late spring. You recognise obviously the importance in terms of um, the, the usefulness of the data, that, um, not only in terms of the immediacy of it but also the um, possibilities of research that this should be on a farm-by-farm -farm basis um, in, in view of evidence that was given to us in the scientific report about uh, the difference in localities and sea locks and, and tides and a whole I, range of issues. If I can try to, to um, say something useful about that and break it down a little bit, clearly there's an interest in having data as soon as possible but there needs to be some sense about what we're going, trying to achieve, what we're going to do with that data, what we're actually going to gain from having that data available. And quite frankly, data in snapshots is of no use to anybody. It needs to be, it needs to be collected in a way that it can be then used to meet 
wider objectives, longer term objectives, enhance research, move the debate forward. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll openly debate how quickly and honestly we can do that. But frankly, the fact is we are prepared to do that. And, and there's no, nothing going to be held back. The data will be used, we hope, for the benefit of the wider, wider, wider industry. But is the statutory obligation to report? Could you comment on that, please, from uh, your, your perspective? Should it be statutory or should it be voluntary, in your view? We have no particular view about that. Thank you. Um, if, it was, if it was statutory, um, I think we'd be doing exactly the same thing. We'd like to make sure that we're actually ahead of regulation as much as we possibly can be in that regard. We have no problem in, in making sure that we do that. And if statute is required to back that up, well, we've, we've had experience of that already with the way that the existing Aquaculture and Fisheries Act um, acts as a backstop for our, for our code of best practice. Right, thank you. And could I take comments from other panel members, please, uh, on the issue uh, from your perspective? Um, I, I certainly believe that it should be a statutory requirement to uh, provide sea lice data. Um, certainly, um, the more regular the data can be provided, um, the better and the sooner the better. If we're trying to identify uh, rapid uh, spikes in sea lice numbers, we want to identify as quickly as possible and act as quickly as possible to uh, solve the problem. Um, I think part of the process for improving that would be identifying a clear methodology, um, a standardised methodology for collecting and presenting sea lice data so that it can be easily accessible and analysed. Um, sorry. No, right. uh, yeah, of course. I mean, openness is, is good. Secrecy is poison in these discussions. Communities like mine don't trust the results otherwise. So the process, not just the, the, the figures that are collected, but what's done with them and that whole explanatory process needs to be clear and it should be a statutory obligation. Um, the Fish Health uh, Organisation that's part of Marine Scotland um, is only for the health of farmed fish, as you know, and the wild fish are not protected by that. These these figures are only used um, for protecting the fish in the cages, and there's no enforcement. So that example from Shetland with, um, it's called Score, Scores Home, 20 lice per fish. The um, enforcement, the only enforcement notice that's been served was served there, and all they did was say, they're gonna be harvested anyway in October, you can just keep them with that level of infection till October. There was no, there was no protection, there was no precautionary principle, there's nothing involved in, in helping wild fish there. And nobody does, there's no agency that's responsible, except that CEPA still has it on its books and should be using biomass reduction to protect wild fish. The so how, how would you see that going forward then? Do you have a view on that? Yeah, it's critical, it's absolutely critical. But, at the moment the council- any detail on it? Yes, okay, the councils do it at the moment, it's part of the planning process, planning applications, and they, they say they get inadequate data from Marine Scotland, um, it doesn't give advice on the population impacts. They don't have enough data about where the sensitive sites are because there's no, nothing's known about migration routes, for instance. Our Garland Butte Council have just pointed that out in their response to the committee. So they don't have the data. They don't have the sensitivity information. They don't have the farm-by-farm -farm data. They can't, in the planning process, look at more than one farm at a time. So they can't look at cumulative effects. Lot Fine's got nine fish farms. If a new one comes up, they look at that one only, uh, the new one. So they can't, they can't see what the consequences are. And then they have um, farm management agreements which only apply to the one farm and planning permission's permanent so you can't get back in and do anything about it. The council don't monitor, They're not, they, don't, they don't have resources. There's no enforcement. So the whole thing's really a shambles. And at the moment, the wild fish are not, represent, not represented by anybody. They need their own agency that takes in the data, analyzes it, decides what to do and enforces it rapidly. And in the pharaohs, for instance, they so, cull after three adult female fish for three weeks, cull all the fish. Very quickly before um, the convener brings in, in others, um, whether you and indeed others, when you're commenting further, have, have a view on what the um, aquaculture consenting review, uh, which um, explored, suggested the exploration of removing the consideration of potential wild salmonoid impacts from planning to be considered in a separate, more appropriate regulatory process. I think it needs some careful thought, more than can be done here, but yes, it, the planning process is no good, but critically, communities only get access to this decision-making process, the public, the people affected by it on the ground, through the planning process. There's no other way to comment. I mean, we can write to CEPA at the CAR stage, but... David Sanderson, I think, wants to come in, and then Stuart Stevens. 
First thing I would like to say is that, in the industry's opinion, the management of sea lice in, in general in Scotland is vastly improved to where it was 15 years ago, and the management tools that we have in our, at our disposal are, 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 are many. Um, so what I, what I would like to say about the comments that I'm hearing here is the industry is working exceptionally hard at trying to manage down the levels of sea lice across all farm sites. Now, inevitably, there's information out there that shows that that's not always successful, and we must do better at all times to get those numbers down. But it's in our best interest to do so, and we, we do so every day. The resources that are thrown at the, the, the whole uh, management regime around sea lice are absolutely huge, and we've had some great success. And what I've seen in the last 15 years in terms of the comparators between the 2002 position and now is an industry that's developed significantly. The companies are much better resourced, better managed, better coordinated. Area coordination of problems is being put into play much more readily now than it was 15 years ago. When you had a significant number of small independent farms, you couldn't get that level of coordination. Now we can bring in all the tools that we need if a problem arises to deal with it. The final thing I'd like to say there is, if we're faced with a problem, we usually have tried everything to try to resolve it. There's nothing that I believe that any other agency could come in and try to do that the industry's not already trying to do itself. And if we work with our regulators, if we work with our fish health inspectorate people closely, we can come to a point where we decide what's best for the livestock on that farm. Everything is done under veterinary supervision, and effectively, we have the tools to do the job. Comments, um, David Sanson, on the uh, on, on the issue around the trigger of the amount of sea lice um, that is involved in your in the reporting mechanism for the regime uh, at the moment. We have we still work to a national treatment strategy, and what we try to do is to manage down sea lice, adult sea lice numbers, so that they are no more than one per fish. Now, clearly, there's lots of information out there that shows that they are more than one per fish. The trigger is for us to instigate a treatment or instigate an action to bring that number down again. It doesn't mean to say we don't go above it. It's the trigger for us to take action. And there's a difference between that and some sort of bar that we're not supposed to cross. Um, when we report, as we do at the moment under legislation to um, Marine Scotland, we are reporting at higher levels, because action needs to take place at higher level, because clearly there's been a failure somewhere. Um, I just wanted to go back to John Aitchison alone um, on his statement that uh, the planning system is not allowed to take uh, account of cumulative effect. Um, every part of the planning system that I'm aware of is required to take account of the cumulative effect, wind turbines, housing and so on and so forth. Can he point me to the part of the law or regulation that prevents cumulative effect uh, being considered in planning decisions in relation to fish farm? Yes, sure. I'll just read what the Garland Butte Council said about it, because it's in their response to... Sorry, I'm really looking for the law, not for what individual councils choose to do because often they, they restrict themselves in ways which, it turns out, are not required by the law. I'm, I'm not speaking about Argyle when I say that in particular, but I would be interested where the legal basis is. Yeah, it would as well. It doesn't sound to me as though, I mean, you should talk to Argyle and Council, really, shouldn't you? If you think they might be not obliged to do what they're doing, wouldn't it be sensible for them to be informed about that? Uh, do forgive me, you said there was a legal barrier. I'm no, interested I, in what I it is. I didn't say that. I said that the council say that they can't... Let me see what it says. Um, an EMP, so an environment management plan, can only relate to specific measures on that farm site. It cannot affect the management of other, other sites in the same farm management area. So there could be 10 active farms with a single farm being managed by an EMP. This farm could be following the EMP, but sea lice levels are higher because the farm is affected by the management of other farms, which are not managed by the EMP. Uh, Convener, perhaps That's we should write to the council and see if they are, in effect, um, failing to look at cumulative effect, because I, I'm a bit suspicious. It may well be, I'm, I'm absolutely good faith, I understand it's been quoted, but I'm, I don't like the sound of what I'm hearing. Certainly something worth qu clarifying. Uh, David Sanderson, briefly. I, I don't really have a comment specifically about 
the legal position, but what I could offer you is that clearly you're, you're talking to a, to a Highland Council planning official later today, so perhaps there's an opportunity there. Um, also, just to add to that, that when we look at environmental, ma environmental management plans, which is quite a new thing in the parlance, um, what we have already is area management plans for, for fish farms. And what we do collectively as an industry is we stock whole areas synchronously and we follow whole areas, areas synchronously. So we do think about things in terms of the overall zone area that's affected by our activities. Okay, we need to move this on. John Scott. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, convener, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for coming to give us evidence today. Um, I want to broaden out the conversation just a little. Um, and last week we heard that there are um, the top three environmental impacts of salmon farming are uh, the feed supply, the future of the, the, the feed supply for fish farming, uh, long-term chemical effects in terms of diffuse pollution, if you like, and also the impacts on the wild salmon population. Shall we start with, um, so just to move on from um, the sea rice problem into the long-term chemical effects of, of the pollution that may result from the ivermectin um, dispersion, dispersion in the environment and the potentials for that as you see them. If I may start, um, as far as the consented licensed products that we have in, in use in Scotland go, clearly they've gone through, uh, they're, they're specifically formulated and licensed for use in the marine environment. We monitor their usage. We have to re regularly report back to uh, SEPA uh, on, on every treatment that takes place. And there are, there are sampling protocols for looking at the sediment and the benthos to see what the, the, the net effect of our operations would be. Now, clearly, there is already some debate about whether or not that footprint is, the, is, the, is telling us everything we need to know or if that's the correct footprint. And, and I believe that, frankly, again, o opening this up so that monitoring can happen at whatever level is required is absolutely fine. Um, there's some work going on to look at specifically what you've mentioned in terms of emmectin benzoate, whether or not the fate of that is as we understand it to be. Um, there's research going on to, to further clarify um, some assumptions about that, and we, wel we await and we welcome that research. Uh, again, we, 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 live on, we live on the back of the evidence that's out there as to whether or not the impact is an acceptable impact, and we've got a proper regulatory system to control it. Others? Um, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, the amount of uh, chemicals being used is obviously of a concern, and in particular, emmectin benzoate. Um, uh, obviously, SEPA's recent reduction in uh, of usage of emmectin just highlights how little we really know about the impact um, it has, uh, particularly in low concentrations. I think assessments at the moment focus particularly on the benthic environment surrounding the farm, but uh, we know that uh, emmectin can impact certain species at low concentrations, so it could be that the impact of emmectin could be much larger, the footprint could be much larger than the uh, the current monitored area. <coughs> Thank you. Um, the reason the chemicals are being used so much is because sea lice have developed resistance to them. So that's, that's the main problem. The, um, all of them need reviewing. It says in the SAMS report that the, the levels that they've been set at and the widespread effects, they can spread eight kilometers. If you put as a, as a methophos into the sea, it can get an eight kilometer plume. The monitoring is inadequate. The, the PAMP2 um, science of this was, was looking at that and said that the only statistical analysis they could do was in Shetland because all the monitoring was dis, disjunct and didn't match up. They couldn't use it to do a big analysis in other areas. What they discovered was that crustaceans are depressed by 60% very far from the fish farms when the emmectin is used, much further than SEPA's modelling allows for. And the SAMS report says that there's no understanding of the long-term, low-level, widespread impact of these things. And um, if I may, just a quote from SEPA. This is from an internal document from FOI. Fish farming is unique in that it's a sector which is allowed to discharge substantial quantities of biocides, some of them priority sub substances in terms of the Water Framework Directive, or at least substance, list two substances in terms of the Dangerous Substances Directive, into waters which salmon farms practically using the same waters in which Scotland's valuable crustacean fisheries are located. It's not tenable for SEPA to adopt a position where commercial shellfish species are impacted by the day-to-day -day activities of fish farms, 
when, when I'm going to paraphrase, when SIPA have knowingly authorised the use of those under the CAR. <coughs> right. I think in the interest... Oh, sorry. So, uh, I'm going to, before we move on to the other headline items, uh, Donald Cameron, on this specifically. Yes, thank you. Can I uh, clarify? To my register of interest and fish farming and fishing therein, um, I just want to carry on this um, question of the effect of discharge um, of medicines and chemicals. Can I start with a, a, a very general question um, in, in terms of um, monitoring um, and the system of monitoring? Because it seems to me that SEPA take a role at the start of the process in terms of the EQS and then the issuing of the licence. Are you, what, do you have any observations on what happens thereafter in terms of monitoring? Okay, um, if I may give a couple of um, indicators about that. Um, when we are consented by SEPA, the consent effectively states quite clearly that any medicine treatment that takes place is done under veterinary control. So the very first thing that happens here is that when you decide you need to treat your fish, you have to involve the advice of your, your veterinary advisor or your veterinary practitioner. So everything that's done from there, there on with the use of a, a treatment is done under that supervision. So that's a fundamental. As well as that, SEPA then lay down the, the um, monitoring requirements within a consent and you have to produce regular reports to SEPA, quarterly reports which show what you've done on a site and also you then have to produce sediment benthos samples on, a, on an annual and biannual basis and those are analysed in relation to your compliance with that consent and whether or not SEPA need to take any action to either alter or, 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 or um, um, reduce that consent. Now th that's a well trodden path and I think there's quite a lot of information in fact, there's absolutely eons of information out there about exactly how that's worked over the last 20 years. I don't think there's any deficit in regard to the, the, the monitoring of the activity that goes on. Okay. Yes, Ms. Cotton. Yeah. So, um, certainly, SEPA sets like a, a, a limit based on the biomass of the fish farmed at that site and uh, on the depot mod modelling impact of the dispersion. Um, but what we don't see really is whether that uh, limit is. Um, if, there's, if a farm operator uses less than that limit and is still able to control the sea lice, does that mean that there's an adjustment in the limits on or the amounts of chemicals that operator can then use? And are there adjustments uh, through long-term monitoring of that? We're not clear on, on the process there. And certainly in terms of uh, monitoring the benthic environment and monitoring the amount of uh, chemicals in the, in the sediment, but not necessarily which species are found in these uh, um, sediments and how the species composition has changed over time through the use of this chemical, um, and or how uh, um, the amounts of chemical being used, how that, in effect, has an impact on the benthic community as well. Um, thank you. SEPA um, modelled this with a with a computer model. So there's a, there's a, you've each got one of these, I think. It's a map from the example where I live in the town of Jura about Duni, and it shows in purple here is what the existing model that CP used to model where the waste, the, the solids, and the amamectin benzoate will go. Um, it suggests it's all underneath the farm, and that they said 99% of it would be swept away. As soon as it leaves that black square, they don't care where it goes, it's gone, as far as they're concerned. Then they did a test with the new model um, and it showed it all went there, not all of it actually, because 86% still leaves the square and they still don't care where it's gone. But the, the bit that goes here in the red area is um, a kilogram per metre squared per year of waste with the amamectin bound in. It's excreted by the fish, so it sits on the seabed. So what I'm saying really is that this model here, the old model, the one that's actually still currently in use and has been used for 15 years to do all the CAR um, uh, permission for pollution, is, is inadequate because it's um, ignoring, it's, it's a flawed model. It ignores the, the fact that the seabed slopes. The reason that that red and the purple areas are different is because the seabed slopes there, but the model doesn't account for that. Now, the industry is expanding into places like this, more fast currents, steeper slopes, more complicated bathymetry, and the model that they use at the moment is inadequate. They have a new one, which will be better, but it still exports 86% of the waste from that site, and then it's ignored, it's gone away. It hasn't gone away. It goes somewhere else and it settles just up the coast. If there's another fish farm a kilometre away, it gets 86% of the waste from this one. That's not in the model. So I just spoke to Anne Anderson. We wrote to her in October. She's from SEPA. She does the consenting compliance. 
Um, we wrote in October, they've apparently replied, I haven't seen the letter yet, but apparently it's been posted, saying that they're going to use the new model instead of the old one. But the new model is opaque. It's not been peer reviewed. No one knows what assumptions it has built into it. It really should be publicly independently scrutinized because the assumptions of computer models determine the outcome. And that model was defined as one of its goals, enabling industry expansion. And that's not a good basis for setting any levels for anything. And Ross, in terms sorry, of- I, Sorry, I need to, to yeah. some of the, the, the committee members in. Mark Roskell. Do you, does the panel believe there's a case then to ban emamectin or simply just to reduce its use? I mean, I'm assuming here that not even industry would want to increase its use, but I may be wrong. Consultation at the moment. And the industry's consulting. It was, the ban was proposed and CEPA withdrew it, apparently under pressure from mm. the industry through the government, which, I mean, this is what's in the press and the Herald, so it does lead us to distrust it. And then temporarily a new level's been set for emamectin and inside MPAs only. And there are two that have just been passed, two Lochduic and Rum fish farms have been passed without that condition. They're in MPAs. So it's not being applied, even though there's been a precautionary thing applied in that one instance. Donald. Sorry, OK, I'll, I'll, um, can I ask a, a, a very general question? We've, we've concentrated a lot. Um, on fish farming in the sea, and the report itself is, is, is primarily focused on that. Obviously, a lot of fish farming happens in freshwater uh, locks. Um, time is short, but do you have any observations on the environmental, in the light of the report, uh, um, on the environmental impacts of fish farming in freshwater? Yes, Sam Collin. Yeah, uh, I think certainly one of the concerns for farming in freshwater is to do with escapes and escapes of juveniles uh, into the river systems and their integration and interbreeding eventually with the wild populations of salmon. Um, certainly for us that's one of the main concerns with uh, the freshwater farming. Of um, Question and also Mark Roskell's one as well. If I take that one first and come back to Mark's one please. Um, in terms of where we are with freshwater smalt production, um, we have, we have significant freshwater production in Scotland, which has been there for quite some time, has been well monitored. Um, we don't really see any fundamental issues with freshwater uh, uh, usage. However, the industry's tr uh, general move in the, in the future will be towards recirculating aquaculture systems and systems which, which will control the, the smoke production in a different way. Um, that's not a wholesale move away from what we do at the moment, it's as well as. So we don't see any fundamental problem with the way that um, um, the, the freshwater element of the business is operated. I acknowledge what uh, uh, Sam is saying about the potential and the potential impact of escapes, but there's no s solid evidence of a problem. Um, we, we acknowledge that it can happen and there is, there is an escapes issue, but there is nothing that, as far as we are aware, has, has demonstrated an actual impact. So I think we again, science is important. We need to really work on that to find out whether or not we can we can we can we can move on from there. And at the moment, we're relatively comfortable with what we do in freshwater, and we're complying with river basin management planning and 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 so on. If I can return to to Mark's um, hypothesis about emamectin, let's just make it absolutely clear: we have very few actual licensed medicines that we use, very few, and. I would, I, would, I would want to state quite clearly that our actual medicine usage is on the decline. Um, we're moving away from, from reliance on chemical usage to use a, a, a wider suite of, of, of things to control sea lice. We're using biological controls using RAS and cleaner, uh, cleaner fish, RAS and lump fish, and we're also significantly investing in what we call physical removal of parasites. And there are many, many things that are, that are currently in the, in, the, in the industry being used, which have to be perfected, and we need to see the outcome, the results of, the, of using those, along with chemical treatments. So over time, we believe that we'll not have to rely on, it's not a case of the industry needing to grow and using more chemicals. I think we have to widen the suite of tools available for us to manage Great, that. Mr. Sanderson. For those of us who lived through the, the passage of the aquaculture bill, we were told then that RAS would be the answer to this. That would get us where we are. Here we are two, three, four years later, and we still have a significant sea lice problem. It always seems to be, we'll get there tomorrow. Um, on the, on, the, on the cleaner fish um, um, story, 
That is an extremely good news story. There's lots of really positive outcomes happening with the use of cleaner fish in air farms. And um, I, would, I would actually dis di di dispute the fact that the lice issue is out of control. I think what we'll see from the actual statistics that the lice issue is not out of control, and in fact the lice numbers are declining rather than increasing. Mark Crossfield, do you want to come back? If, if I take your, your response to that question, Mr Sanderson, at face value, that you have other tools in the box to control lice, then why would you not support a ban on the use of emamectin? Um, because I don't believe that there's a case being proven for emamectin having the impact that is alleged. I think we need to wait until the, 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 the studies that are currently underway are completed and then take a view as to whether or not we've now got to the point where we can, under, under peer-reviewed uh, 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 evidence, got the inf information required to make such a decision. I don't believe at this time that, that, um, that that's, that's appropriate. And I would also see, see that as another example of a precautionary approach where we've already agreed with the regulator that we should reduce its usage. Okay. We need to move on. The two other headlines um, that were identified last week were the sustainability of feed supplies and then um, the effect on the wild. Uh, population. So John Scott um, on the feed supplies and then Richard Lyle on the latter. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, is looking to the sustainability of feed supply um, in future, I mean, how do you see in, uh, the expansion of the industry carrying on with um, cutting to the chase the lack of availability of omega 3s um, in terms of a, a sustainable? catch of the food supply. Okay, um, we could spend quite a lot of time on this one, but I'll try and, and, and say something which could be helpful to, to the committee. In regard to um, what our future outlook is for feed supply, we do not actually see any issue in terms of our ambitions for growth. And that's because we've moved away from um, over complete reliance on marine ingredients towards a mix of marine and plant stroke vegetable ingredients. And in terms of fish meal, there really isn't an issue. Um, we're already able to substitute to the correct levels to maintain the right level of the important omega-3 elements that we need to retain in the diet, and as a result, we, we don't see any issues. We, we will have a pressure on the fish oil element of what we put into our diets, and that's the one that we, we do need to have uh, sound solutions to. Already, however, we've got significant developments in relation to things like algal oils, and other substitutes from plant and vegetable oils that do provide the omega-3s that we need for the diet. The one thing I would say, however, is that there's a finite resource of marine oils out there globally. Our industry is best placed to utilise as much of that marine oil as we possibly can, and that's our strategy for looking forward to the future. We'll continue to use the appropriate level of marine oil, and we would regard ourselves as the prime customer for such a resource, rather than it being used to... Um, frankly, be put into other products which are maybe not providing the same protein package and healthy food stuff that we provide. Thank you. Ms. Yeah, um, I think it's important to uh, clarify at the moment that the resources for salmon farm feed are already stretched, particularly for marine resources when we're talking about fish oils. Uh, just last week, uh, it was mentioned that the anchoveta population in South America is already at maximum sustainable yield, and that was a main source of fish oils. Uh, for the industry, so um, that is a limiting factor if we want to maintain the omega-3 uh, values. Um, secondly, one thing that's not really considered when talking about sustainable feed is the high level of mortality rates in the industry at the moment. Um, so figures of 10 million fish dying in 2016, we have to recognise that a lot of the feed uh, has gone into feeding these 10 million fish which eventually go to landfill and don't go to market. So when we're looking at conversion rates, uh, we need to look at feed used and the amount of uh, fish that actually goes to market rather than the f number of fish being fed. Um, and finally, on just uh, the requirements for feed, if we're moving towards the use of cleaner fish to control sea lice, this is another farmed fish essentially that will need a, a supplementary food source that also needs to be factored into uh, the requirements of food. And they don't live on sea lice alone then? N uh, not alone. They feed on <laughs> them, but that's not the only thing they eat, and they do require supplementary feed as well. I see. Right. OK, thanks, thanks for that information. So, Mr. H. Um, it, basically, it's not sustainable, and the industry says it is. It ought to not be allowed to say 
that it's sustainable when the food that the fish are fed is not sustainable. And Sam's quite right about mortality. They're not included in those figures for the outcome of fish produced compared to the, out the input of fish fed to the fish. Forgive me, I thought, forgive me, I thought it was the scientists who said that we were at the li limit yes. of maximum sustainable yield, yes. but that it, we were at that limit. But yes. alternatives but would need to be found. It, but you're saying that's not correct? Yes, that's right. Because, well, for one thing, we're planning to double the capacity. So if we're at the biomass limit for sustainable fisheries for anchovies, for instance, where's that going to come from? So that's not sustainable if you're going to go into new fisheries including krill, for instance, which is the next thing on the list of foods that contain omega-3 that, omega that you could feed to salmon. And the other thing is if you feed plant proteins to fish, you have to justify where they come from. And if you're feeding mainly soya, which is what is fed to them primarily, it mostly comes, it doesn't mostly come, much of it comes from areas where the forests have been felled in order to grow it. And then there's the question of whether you're taking agricultural land out of production for f producing food, plant food that people could eat in order to feed it to fish to less efficiently convert it into food that people can eat. So David Sanderson wants to come back on that. I, I, I think, I think we, can, we can certainly debate sustainability long and hard. However, let's just get some facts straight. In terms of the actual usage of the Scottish salmon farming industry of, of fish meals and fish oils in our feedstuffs, they, were, they are 100% sourced from sustainable sources that are either certified by the um, IFO um, Responsible Fishing Scheme or the MSC. And we acknowledge, as I've already stated, that there's a finite resource that we need to better manage. We're not going to magically find more fish, and we're certainly not going to be looking for um, species that are not appropriate to our feeding uh, regime. Yes, we've got to find alternatives, and yes, we've got to make sure that we properly manage plant and vegetable uh, alternatives. However, we don't see any problem in so doing. Uh, this is a, a question, I think, simply uh, for Mr. Sanderson. It's been suggested to me that retailers are uh, laying down minimum quantities of uh, fish-based uh, content to feed that might be different from lower levels that the industry believe they could undertake. To what extent are retailers influencing what uh, salmon are being fed in this particular domain? It, it's a circular discussion. Um, retailers reflect what consumers are telling them, and consumer panels, etc., will tell, will tell consumers, certainly in the UK, that they, they have a preference for um, the knowledge that a, a farmed fish is fed a marine diet. Or, 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 or substantially a marine diet. So we, our preference is to maintain a, high, a higher marine oil in our, in our fish than other countries. So, for instance, if you buy a Norwegian salmon or a Norwegian fillet or a Chilean fillet, it will have a lower level of marine oils in it than Scottish salmon. Now, that might well be a good point of difference for us to maintain. I see absolutely no reason whatsoever why we shouldn't be the prime customer for the available marine ingredients that are there for for, for that purpose. That is the best use of that product. Right, let's move this on to look at the impacts on whale populations. Richard Lyle. Thank you, Kinnear. Good morning. Um, I want to turn my attention to escapees from fish farms and potential effects on whale population. If I was a farmer, I would take every step to ensure, uh, to increase my production through environmental uh, ways. If I was a salmon producer, I'd be taking every step to ensure no product loss. Yet we're told thousands of salmon go out of pens. And I see you nodding your head, uh, Mr Sanderson. Why is that? Why, why are we losing thousands? If you want to increase production and you want to ensure that you grow the industry, why are you allowing thousands of salmon to disappear off your, your pens? I think the first thing I have to say, and you're not going to be surprised to hear me say it, is that the first thing we're going to do is try to make sure we don't have any escaped fish. It's the product that we want to get to market. So every effort is made to not have escaped fish. Um, and I'll, I'll mention now, if I may, that the, the industry has, has worked with regulators to produce what's known as the Scottish Technical Standard. Now, that is a standard to try and up the game, to keep driving down the level of escapes in the industry. And I know it's difficult when we're talking about quite large numbers to get that into perspective, but we have around about 65 million salmon in operational sites around Scotland at any given time. And I think the literature that the SAMS report has provided shows that 
on average, we may have 100, over, over quite a long period of time, the average is 146,000 fish per year out of a population of 65 million. I can't quite do the sums, but it's quite a low percentage. Now, I'm not trying to, 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 to diminish the issue of escaped fish, because clearly even 146,000 average per annum is an unacceptable level, and industry's intention is to do everything possible to drive that figure down lower to zero. So do you, you know, and, and to bring in the panel, do you believe that uh, this is avoidable or unavoidable uh, in open water? And you know, what can be done to, to them? And even, you know, you say 147,000 is negligible. I so, didn't say you that. Know, <laughs> I didn't you know, say that. Well, I, I would say 147,000 is not negligible, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, even one escaping is enough. I, I didn't say it was negligible. If I can, if I can maybe just make, make a further point on that. The other thing about it is that those is, the actual number of those fish that might survive in the wild is very small. And um, we don't believe we have an actual problem in terms of... Have you any proof about that? Well, we know... Any data about that? I don't no, think so. We don't have hard numbers, but what we do know is that fishermen catch a lot of them and seals eat a lot of them. I, I, I have another two questions, convener. I'm sorry, the, the panel may want to answer the first one, but I, I'm, I'm coming to the second question in regards to that. I mean, that, that's the seals eat most of the ones that escape. The, the report, the SAMS report, is very clear about the number um, that go into rivers, the effect it has. They say that the genetic mixing as a result is unequivocal evidence that interbreeding and genetic mixing of farm salmon and wild populations can have impacts on the life history of wild populations and negatively influence the dynamics and viability of populations. We're looking at population level. That's the one criteria that's difficult to prove normally on on something as, as nomadic as a wild salmon, there's proof, population impact. Escapes in Norway are the biggest reason, even above sea lice, for the harm to wild fish. And really, it's unacceptable to say half, that half the Scottish population of wild salmon are allowed to escape that number every year. It's an underestimate, because there's a drip escape through damaged nets. It's just nonsense that it makes no difference. So it's your contention that there is a genetic mix and effect, yeah, yeah, yeah it's so definitive. Report, right, mm. okay. Um, you've covered the second question that I want to ask. What action would you suggest that the industry take, uh, do now, and, and consider in the future to prevent escape, uh, escapees or uh, escapes and prevent uh, integration where escapes do occur? Containment. They must be, they must be contained, contained in tanks, not in nets, because nets are vulnerable to damage and loss. I think certainly uh, stricter protocols on how fish are managed uh, to try and cut out the human error will be really important. But in terms of the equipment being used, and uh, like much stronger netting would be an easier way just to ensure fewer fish escape. But also, uh, if you can contain fish and create a, a, a solid barrier between the farmed and wild fish, that would obviously cut down escapes a lot. Yeah. So, Mr Sanderson, before I finish, would you agree that you have to do better? Yes, we would agree we have to do better. Um, I'll refer again to the Scottish Technical Standard, which actually covers off quite a lot of what the gentleman's asking about here. I'd also say that we need to be continually innovating in terms of cage design. We're obviously moving into more robust exposed waters. As we do so, we have the technology and the, and the sturdiness of, of, of cage structures to do that. And we're not going to go into more exposed areas unless we're absolutely sure that we've got the right kit to do so. And again, I would say I'm not, I'm not in any way diminishing the, 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 the numbers or, 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 or trying to make a case that we, we can live with that. Um, I, I think the numbers, as they are at the moment, can be driven down further, and our industry is intent on doing so. Thank you. Before I, I bring Alec Rowley in, uh, Mr Sanderson, just a little confusing here. In November of last year, the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation produced a report called Sustainable, and I suggest Sustainable Scottish Salmon. And in the foreword, the Cabinet Secretary makes the point that he's determined to see the growth of the sector achieved without detriment to the wider environment. But not once, anywhere else in this report, is there a reference to environmental responsibility and sustainable practices. Um, is there not a disconnect there between what we're hearing today and what's in this document? I don't think there's a disconnect in, in the minds of anybody in our industry in that regard. Um, every policy that's set by the Scottish Government and the regulatory agencies that, uh, that work on behalf of the Government 
clearly defines the balance needed between the industry's economic obligations or, or, or objectives and the need to do that in a, in a manner that's in tune with the environment. And it's absolutely written into the script as far as we're concerned. We work in the natural environment every day, 365 days of the year. We can actually be probably seen as, as in a good place to be guardians of the environment from that point of view. And, and, and we can be of assistance to agencies in many, many ways in terms of what's going on out in the, in the natural world. OK. Uh, Alec Rowley. Convener, the, um, Richard Lyle talked about and asked the question, why lose thousands of fish? Um, every year because they're misgating. But I think a lot of the public are starting to wake up and ask the question, why lose millions of fish every year to disease? And if I could perhaps come to that a bit. Um, I know the Marine Scotland Science, Fish and Health Inspectorate has said that throughout the 1990s and 2000s, there was around 20% mortality of farmed salmon throughout the production cycle. They, they go on to say that this seems to have increased from 2014 to the present day. So my first question would be, what level of mortality is there throughout the production process currently? Um, and what is the, the main causes for this level of mortality? Um, and how does the industry deal with this massive number of dead fish? OK. Um, the first bit of the question there is about the numbers and the historical and, and current position. Um, the numbers are the numbers as reported. I, 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 I'm not able to give you a, a specific current set of numbers because until we have those reports finalised and, and, and in, the, in the, the hands of the fish health inspectors, we can, we can speculate about the numbers. The average that, that, that you've described, um, we, would, we, would, we would look to a normal farming operation to be lower than that. We wouldn't accept that that's a, that's a, that's a norm. Um, we've had a couple of bad years where we've had significant issues on top of what, what you would call normal operating um, uh, issues, mainly caused by gill health challenges. The gill health challenges in themselves have led to probably increased mortality in some cases, but also they've led to other problems in terms of the need for those fish to be to be, to be cared for in terms of treatments that, that are more difficult because of the gill health challenges. So we have a complex set of reasons why mortality has increased. In terms of how we deal with it, um, you've quite rightly said attention has been focused on the fact there's large volumes of fish that have to be transported from remote areas to central sites to be disposed of. Unfortunately, that is a fact of life, and it's one that we, we wish to see solid, biosecure control over. We don't want to see any problems in that regard, but that's the disposal route that's available to us. There's a, a set of waste regulations in Scotland that um, we have to comply with in terms of the, the proper disposal of fallen stock, and this applies across a range of different livestock uh, sectors. The, the fallen stock issue is one that has to be dealt with the same in fish farmers as it would be in any other livestock production. So we have to dispose of those fish in a, in a biosecure manner to an approved facility. Thank you. Um, I'm just wanting to pick up on uh, figures mentioned earlier by David. So uh, David mentioned that there's about 65 million farmed salmon in Scotland, and we know that in 2016 there were 10 million fish that uh, were mortalities. So this suggests that there's still a 10 to 15% mortality rate, which is clearly unacceptable. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Sometimes higher. I mean, some farms, Colin say, lost 150,000 fish last summer. So we're looking at sometimes they're getting up to 40%, some of these things. And th at the previous hearing, you asked, somebody asked what the normal levels would be in a farm, and it's about 4 to 8% for chickens. And this sort of thing, people care about this. They watched the one show. They saw those trucks with 160,000 dead fish coming off Lewis, dripping waste onto the road. People watch television. They watch Blue Planet. They know that these things are... The, 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 they care about the sea. They're demonstrating it. They're joining networks of groups like the one I belong to. So it, this isn't something to just think, oh, it's only an isolated thing. It only applies to fish farming. It applies to all the people in Scotland. We care about the sea. We rely on it being clean for our jobs. We, we mind. Don't these mortality figures suggest that somewhere along the line you're getting this approach wrong? I mean, this is a huge mortality rate in all its guises. Doesn't it tell you, as an industry, you've got a real problem here? Um, I'm not going to try to diminish the scale of the challenge that we have here. And what I would say is that 
there are factors that have to be understood about why those mortality events are happening. I've mentioned gill, gill health. Gill health is, is caused by changes in the environment where we have jellyfish and algal bloom issues and planktonic movements which affect our fish. Now, we, we, must, we, must, we must do better at preparing for that eventuality and being, being in the best place to do something to try and negate it. The trouble is that we are actually, we are actually um, affected by it. We then have to take management decisions as to how to deal with it. Um, from time to time, that will affect us worse than other times. And we've had a couple of particularly bad years. That's not the picture. Mortality is something that fluctuates quite a lot over, over, over the, time, the, the time period. And if we look at mortality data, it does go up and down. Okay. Uh, two colleagues want brief supplementaries before I come back to, to, to uh, Alec. Uh, firstly, Edward Mountain and then Mark Roscoe. Uh, thank you, Convener, and I'd like to declare an interest that I have in a wild fishery. Um, just on the issue of mortality, if I may, uh, one of the issues is gill disease, and the report identifies that that's a factor of increasing temperatures and happens uh, in a lot of cases in summer months, um, and that would bear out from the figures that I've seen. Could you just con confirm to me whether you think mortality is going to lessen, i.e. the temperature increase that we've seen it, it is just passing and therefore isn't going to be a future problem? And the second point is, is that one of the ways to combat gill disease is to harvest fish earlier. And my, therefore my question to you is, uh, mortality might be being masked by uh, early harvesting. Would you care to comment on those two questions so I could understand it a bit better, please? Um, in terms of whether we think that the the the, the forward trajectory is, is is that we're going to have more of the same, which is I think what you're saying, um, there is a def definite difference in sea temperature over the last say 15 years. Um, it's it's one of these things that is, it's extremely difficult for us to fully understand the implications of that. And again, we need more we need more science, we need more evidence to back up the the, the, the actual impacts of of that type of change in the marine environment. So we'll work very, very closely with anybody who wishes to try to help to better understand that. And I can't really say more than that in terms of whether we think that's that's here for, 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 for the future. Um, in terms of how we deal with the challenge of gill health, um, might, I, might, I, might I look at, at some of the solutions that we're actually already in a position to try to, to put into play? We're investing heavily in the ability to treat fish with fresh water in well boats or in other contained units so that we can actually do away with most of the gill problems that, 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 that actually affect those fish. Washing, washing those gills with fresh water and putting them back into the cages again is, is a very good way of dealing with part of the problem. And I think we need to see how that progresses and whether that helps us to overcome the difficulty. Ultimately, when we have a situation where gill health has deteriorated beyond the point at which it's, it's sensible to keep those fish in the sea, then yes, we will, we will harvest those fish out early. It's in the best interest of those animals to come out. Sorry, just, just so I understand that. So uh, understand that when you treat fish, that they stress, and the more stress you put under them under, the, the more likely they are to die. But what you're saying is, is, is that when you identify there's a gill problem um, and you can't treat it, you will harvest them and, and put them through uh, no, normal production methods into the food chain. Yes, absolutely. These are not diseased fish. There's no, there's no, there's no implications in terms of public health, in terms of the, the status of those fish. Um, I think we need to make that absolutely clear. There's no, there's no issue about the, the fish coming through to the, to the market from, from, um, from, 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 from that sort of a, an outcome. Um, I mean, it seems to me this is a general point as well, but, um, why would you expand an industry which has got all these problems without fixing the problems first? It's fundamental, isn't it? These are big problems of, of illness and stuff. Why don't we fix them and then expand? And one way of fixing them is to separate the fish, the wild fish, from the farmed fish by enclosing the farmed fish in contain can containers. Yeah, briefly, Sam, call. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to point out, although these diseases do exist naturally in the environment, it's actually the density at which these fish are farmed that is the cause for these outbreaks. And if we're increasing the size of these farms and the number of farms, we're only going to see uh, the number of these outbreaks increase. And if you then add increasing sea temperatures, which will increase the rate of outbreaks, this clearly isn't a problem that's going to go away soon. Okay. Uh, Mark Roscoe followed by uh, Alec Crowley.
John Scott. If I could just go back to David Sanderson. In, in answer to my earlier question about mortality rates, you confirmed that every single farm in Scotland will produce its own mortality data and there will be the causes of, those, of, of that mortality broken down by disease. Is that, that correct? That's what you said. What we'll have is we'll have a, a report which, which has a commentary which highlights where a disease issue is, is at play and the, there'll be a percentage for mortality and if that percentage is obviously something that's not normal, then we'll explain what the reason for that mortality is. So what you're saying now is that the, the gill disease is the major cause of mortality. Is that, is that correct? No. Because I'm trying to get clarity at this point as to okay. what the picture is. You focused in on one particular disease. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to work out whether this is the main reason why you've doubled the mortality rate within three okay. years. Is that the main reason or not? No, not in its right, own right. Okay. So if what's I the might, reason then? If I, might, if I might say that it, as far as we're concerned, if you look at the overall picture, fish health in Scotland is actually very good indeed. Um, yes. But fish health is actually very good. What we have is a situation where we're impacted by environmental conditions which from time to time will affect the fish. That then is compounded by potential complex gill issues, and that makes the fish more susceptible to other, other problems, uh, including, including the effect of parasites. So we'll have a complex situation where there's less ability for those fish to uh, be optimal, if you like, in terms of their performance, and that then makes us have to take choices about what we do about that. Um, from time to time, those algal stroke jellyfish issues will be actually the main reason why large fish kills happen. If you look at the statistics, a lot of the, the mortality is around, is around natural conditions that lead to the death of fish. I mean, earlier, Mr Sanderson, you said fish health is the core of our business. And with 20, 25% of fish dying of disease, then you would have to surely say there's a problem at the core of your business. And would you not agree that rather than expanding that business, you actually have to start to look at what these problems are? Today, uh, in terms of, and one, I'm not getting a clear, clear view that you, there is a clear understanding uh, of what the issues are. Um, in terms of data and data being collected and the point that, that, that you've just said, you, you seem to announce that data will now be collected farm by farm, but you don't seem to suggest that, that the industry actually knows the, the detail of the causes of why millions upon millions of fish are dying of disease, and therefore what plans is in place uh, and would you not agree, and the rest of the panel agree, that, that we should actually halt the growth of this industry until we actually get to some answers on what is a significantly serious problem, it would seem to me, for the industry, that, that almost seems to be just being ignored? If I it's like start we'll, it. we'll keep going and we'll keep, we'll, keep, we'll keep farming more, and if we farm more, more will die, but that will not matter because we'll get more to the market. That can't surely be the way ahead. If I may start with where you finished there about how, how we're not doing anything about it, I just think that's, that we obviously require to get more information to this committee and others about what we are doing about it because we are significantly trying to address those challenges and we're actually overcoming significantly those challenges as well. Um, I don't believe for one minute that we're not taking that seriously. And, and in terms of whether we believe that we can grow, we've set ourselves ambitious targets any industry that's, that's successful will try to be ambitious and, and it will set its targets and it will set quite clear plans out as to how to achieve those targets. But we are the first ones to say we'll not achieve those targets unless we overcome some of the challenges that we've faced in, in recent times. We have a consenting regime in Scotland that's extremely robust. Any growth that we get in Scotland will be in line with the consenting regime that we have to go through to get, to get that growth in place. Um, we're not going to achieve that growth unless we can actually keep our fish uh, in, in good health. And as I, I'll repeat again, fish health is the absolute priority. We do fully understand exactly what's happening with the fish in our, in our care. We understand exactly the, the complex variety of reasons why mortality, uh, as it builds up to a cumulative total, is a difficult figure to try to talk around. 
We can talk about how we break it down. I don't think that's going to help us. Uh, we're, we're, we just have to make an improvement across the board in terms of that. We fully understand what's going on in our farms, and we think we've got the tools to deal with those challenges. We need to work in partnership with government regulators and others to make sure that we can all contribute to that, because we, we, not, we don't necessarily have all the answers, and we welcome, we welcome assistance and help from others who might, who might actually be experts in the field that we're in and, and, and assist us in that in that objective. Perhaps, but, Mr. Mr. Sanders, let's get some quantification around your answer to Mr. Railway's point. Um, you said earlier that you would work with anybody to develop the science as a sector. Mm -hmm. um, could you outline for us how much the sector has contributed financially to the development of science in the last few years and the extent to which it feels it should be contributing going forward if we're to develop a robust scientific base? What sort of sums of money is the, the sector putting in? I'm not going to give you one number because I don't have one number, okay. if, if, I, if, uh, if I may. Um, but I can try to maybe build some information here that, mm -hmm. that could be helpful. If we look at if we look at what's happening across the whole sphere of what we call R and D across the the, the, the the whole the whole salmon industry, then that number is a very large number. It it will include work that's done cross nationally because some of the work that's done is just as equally applicable in Scotland as it, as it would be in, in, say, Norway or Canada. Um, and I don't see any problem with that. We, 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 we know the, there's an international community. We have European-wide projects that we invest in, in terms of the, uh, the necessary science and development uh, understanding that we have. Specific to Scotland, because we heard last week that in Norway, the sector contributes quite markedly to the, the development of science. Yeah. What specifically is the Scottish industry contributing? Over the piece, I would say that the range of the answer to that question would be between 15 and 25 million pounds a year. Okay. However, as I say, some of that will be collaborative projects that have got an EU element, not specific to Scotland. Okay. If you don't have the detail beyond that, and I understand you may not have today, perhaps you could write to us with that information to flesh that out that answer. Um, happy to take that away and try and do that so in more detail. To follow up on, on for others to come back on Mr. Rowley's questions. Um, so, sorry, but I'll come back with a supplementary for mm. me. Mr. Rowley, thank you. Um, can I just summarise it? It seems to me the sea lice weaken the fish, lots of sea lice. Then disease and treatment kills the fish. Some of the sea lice kill the fish too. Then the industry says that's okay, we can kill them early and sell them to people to eat. And then it's okay to expand on that basis. And then, incidentally, the expansion plan has become government policy, apparently uncritically, without thinking of these things until now, after the expansion's approved. So then it depends on the consenting regime, but the consenting regime doesn't include the impact on the wild salmonids. And there's proof in these reports that there's a population effect there. They're not represented by an agency of any type, so they're not, they're not in this, really. And then the report says there's no data, Mr. Sanderson says there's no data. There's no public data about the effect of diseases. And then um, the industry relies, or everybody relies on the industry to sample these things itself. And we're asking what funding the industry puts into science. Why doesn't the industry put funding into independent monitoring like happens in other countries, in, Canada, in Alaska, for instance, with the fisheries, where there are independent observers who do the sampling? It would make, make sense to separate the industry from the regulator. At the moment they're like this, they're really close, and it's too, it's, we don't trust it. Okay, Sam Cohen. Um, I just wanted to make a comment really on the, the targets of the industry uh, and the government targets as well, and how these targets are calculated. Um, certainly coming from an industry perspective, I've read 300 to 400,000 tonnes by 2030, and that's clearly based on uh, the growth of the industry and public demand. But this, this target doesn't take into account at all the, the capacity of the environment to actually farm that quantity of salmon. Um, what we need to do is to take a much more ecosystem-based approach uh, to planning the, um, the growth and development of the industry by figuring out where salmon farming can actually take place and what is the, the carrying capacity of that environment. We talked a lot about the assimilative capacity uh, in the SAMS report. That should guide how to calculate the carrying capacity. And it's this information we need to be able to set realistic growth targets that fall within environmental limits. Okay. Briefly, Mr. Sanderson, do you want to come back on that? 
I actually wanted to just add something to the previous question about research taken on board that uh, you're looking for more information. Um, one of the areas where we, we're, we're putting significant effort in recent times is in the Scottish Aquaculture Innovation Centre, which is um, a significant body of, of work going on on some of the main issues that we're dealing with today. That body have calculated that for every one pound of public funds that goes into uh, the, the, the work that's carried out there, that then uh, 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 multiplies up to six pounds in terms of the impact from industry contributions. That's not direct cash contributions always. That's that's the the calculation of the industry contribution across all across all sectors. Okay, thank you. Uh, a number of colleagues have got brief supplementaries. John Scott followed by Stuart Stevenson followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. I'll endeavour to be brief. And declare I notice as a farmer, um, I particularly well understand what you say, uh, Mr. Sanderson, about the. A combination of diseases um, and challenges to fish uh, having a cumulative effect and weakening them at different periods in their life and at different periods in cycles. Um, is there any research that you could let us have in that regard about the synergies of combinations of challenges working to cause deaths? Please, because I think that would be helpful. And if it doesn't exist, I think it's a piece of research that should be made, because it might go some way to explaining um, these deaths, which apparently, are, in my view, are all interconnected in all probability. Um, I further wanted to ask you the views of the panel generally. And uh, as I said, declaring as a farmer, I'm very aware of the spread of disease subject to climate change, particularly in the land-based industries, such as blue tongue and Schmallenberg's disease, which are coming um, from Mediterranean temperatures and North and Sub-Saharan Africa. And is that where this um, gill disease, is that is that attributable to that type of similar spread north because of temperature change? I would welcome all your views. Okay. Um, well, in terms of the first question about whether we have we, we have um, research evidence about about the cumulative impact of different types of, of challenge disease, um, I, I'm afraid I'm not in a position to give you a definitive answer. I don't actually know. Um, however, I, I'm very happy to take that away and talk to the veterinary profession. And, and it well, may well be that this committee could do with some some input from the veterinary advisors as to what the potential scenarios there may be. Um, in relation to why this is happening. There is definitely some uh, 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 effect from, from climate change. What we've ten tended to see with amoebic gill disease is it spread from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. And when we saw how it spread throughout Scotland, it started in Ireland and moved north. So there's something in that. But again, I don't think we've got enough science to demonstrate that that is of any, of any, of any significance. And is it completely related to that? I don't think that's a, 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 a completely understood uh, hypothesis either. Thank you. Um, just a, a couple of comments. Uh, firstly, in terms of the spread from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere and then the potential spread from Ireland north, um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a natural movement of the disease. It could also be human transportation and malpractice as well. So certainly biosecurity is a, a large issue there when talking about the spread of disease. Um, Coming back to the effects of climate change, um, as I mentioned previously, the main reason these, we get these outbreaks is the density that these fish are farmed at, and that's where, why we get these outbreaks. And certainly climate change and warming sea surface temperatures will only exacerbate that problem. John H. Thank you. Um, there's also several mentions in here of cleaner fish carrying disease. So the wrasse are caught wild, many of them. They're breeding one-tenth of the number needed, the predicted number needed of 10 million. They, there's two examples of diseases in RAS and one in lump suckers. The Norwegians are really worried about lump sucker disease, it says in their fish health report from last year. So some of these solutions are not solutions necessarily. They may bring in other problems. Stuart Stevens, to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Um, in the wild salmon population, age cohort by age cohort, are they more or less likely to die in the wild than they are on the farm? In other words, what's the baseline against which we're measured? It's another area where there's a lack of information, and maybe should the government have looked for this information sooner? Because you certainly need it before you plan expansion. But one thing that's really clear is that the young fish, the smolts going to sea, are affected by sea lice more than the big fish coming back. And the smolts that spend the longest time 
close to the shore are sea, are sea trout, which are priority marine feature and should be protected by our rules. So they spend the longest time, they get the highest level of sea lice, they die, and the ones that pass through the salmon smolts generally are getting more, more infections, more sea lice as they go north. The ones from the very northwest corner of Scotland get away, and the ones facing west and lower some places get away quicker with less so, exposure. So you're saying there's a difference between the east coast and the west coast, there where is. there are farms and not farms, because that's not the evidence I've given. That's actually had. not what I was saying, although that is true. There's a graph there. I've given you all about that. But the the um, what I was saying was that the sea, this is sea lice, not disease. But the sea lice are affecting the fish that spend the longest in the coastal waters. And sea trout, which we've generally ignored in the Sam's report, is very muddled about this. There are two salmon. It's wild salmon, wild sea trout. And the sea trout are also protected, and they're also impacted by, by salmon farming, by the lice from the salmon farming. We should be protecting sea trout too. It's an obligation, biodiversity protection, and also the precautionary principle. So, Mr. Sanderson, are they more likely to survive in the wild than they are in a farm? If or I may vice versa? If I may start by saying that... Um, Industry recognises that we will have some impact at all levels on, as a result of all our activity, and we will have some impact on wild salmonids. In, in, in regard to what that impact is, I don't think that's easily measured. However, what I would say is that in terms of that impact vis-à-vis -vis what happens out in the, in the marine world, in terms of marine survival of wild salmonids, it is insignificant in terms of the impact from marine, in terms of general marine survival from a number of different reasons. I think we have to get that absolutely clear. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. And I've got two questions which I appreciate the panel could answer very briefly in terms of, of time, not, and that sh doesn't, doesn't obviously reflect the importance of any of these issues. Um, I want to return to the transportation and disposal, disposal of dead fish and um, panel members may be aware uh, that in March 2017, last year, that there was um, an accident where a transport lorry on the A A9 shed its load. Um, is the regulation and are the protocols and enforcement regimes clear, fit for purpose, uh, or if not, should they change, and if so, how? So that's my first question. And my second question... Because it's um, nearing the end, and there are others that want to come in, again, could you be brief? Um, a brief comment, which I think um, John Aikes and you've already referred to, but on the relationship between marine protected areas and uh, fish farms. Could I start with that one? Um, marine protected areas have a, a lower EQS, that's the allowable quantity of emamectin, that's the specific limitation, but it's not being applied at the moment by SEPA. They've just approved two farms which don't have this limitation. It only applies to marine protected areas where there's a sensitive feature. But the report, the SAMS report, says there's hardly any information about which of the 81 priority marine features actually are sensitive to chemicals or other impacts of, of, of salmon farms. Um, also, some of these marine protected features can swim. I mean, the flapper skate where I live, which are critically endangered, as rare as rhinoceroses, and they can, the excuse is, oh, they can swim away. They won't be affected. They're in the only place that's protected for them in the world, and they can apparently swim away. So um, it's not true that there's no impact on wild salmon. It's when they go, go to sea and come back again that most of them die at sea. It's a 33% difference in Ireland, up to 33% of the ones that come back to, to spawn, limited, reduced by um, what happens to them. From, from the sea lice. Um, on, on infection um, and transportation, I don't know the answer. Um, could, could I really just pick up on uh, marine protected areas and our concerns? So I agree with John that the, the SAMS report um, does very little to kind of address the impact on marine protected areas, uh, particularly the network of nature conservation MPAs. Maybe that's maybe due to a lack of resources available, but that's certainly something we need to look into, uh, particularly in light of the fact that the majority of uh, salmon farming growth, uh, predicted growth, will impact ensure nature conservation MPAs, many of which have protected features that are at direct risk from aquaculture um, activity. Um, and in terms of disposing of uh, salmon mortalities, I'm, I'm not in a position to really answer that. David Sanderson. Um, 
Okay, we'll start with the, 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 the last one first, as, as others have done. Um, again, in terms of um, where we sit vis-a-vis -vis MPAs, our industry absolutely recognises the, the, the suite of different um, designations that have been placed throughout Scotland for a variety of reasons, whether it, for, whether it be for protection of species, a specific species or not. We, we recognise how we have to live within that environment in terms of the siting that we, 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 we need to uh, think about when we're, when we're putting farms in place. We don't believe, however, that that means we can't have a farm either in or near an MPA. It depends on what exactly we're trying to protect. So again, we'll work with all agencies to make sure that we're complying with the expectations surrounding the designation, and we'll also help with the management of the designation where that's appropriate. Uh, I think we're in a good place to do so in some cases. Um, so we have absolutely no issues whatsoever with the, the regulatory environment that, that pervades around about protecting the marine environment. I think that's an absolute given. Um, in terms of the appropriateness of the regulation around transport, and specifically whether it's working or not, I, I really don't believe I can comment. Um, we understand the, 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 the regulatory position, and we, 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 we do everything we possibly can in terms of biosecurity. I can't say an accident will never happen. I don't know the specific details of the accident you mentioned and whether that led to any problem or not. Um, what I would say, again, is if there's any evidence whatsoever that we're not following proper biosecurity measures for the transport of waste or anything else for that matter, we want to know about it. We, we need to know that there's a problem and then we'll fix it. Right, it's probably a question for the next panel then. Thank you. It may well be. <laughs> uh, thank you. Moving on, Mark Roscoe. Um, thank you, Convener. Can I turn to the issue of uh, waste, nutrients, um, faeces, food, all of that stuff that's um, lining the seabed? Um, we've got new uh, depositional zone regulations that are being consulted on um, at the moment, which on the face of it would, would seem to allow the expansion of uh, fish farms in uh, more exposed uh, locations. Um, while requiring a you know a tightening up of the of the monitoring of, of nutrient waste, um, we had some evidence last week. Dr. Hughes, in relation to the DZR um, approach, said, as is his words, it's difficult to say whether the scientific evidence supports a move to DZR because we don't know what such a move would mean. Um, can I get opinions from the panel then about what you see the impact of DZR actually being? If I could start and, 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 and let others come in, um, one of the things that came out of the report last week, which we read with great interest and then had to think a wee, wee bit about, was the concept of adaptive management. Um, we quickly came to the conclusion that we've been doing that for a long time, and, and we have lots of examples of adaptive management. We probably haven't called it that up to now. It's a good phrase, however, and actually, probably, in relation to what's being proposed or at least consulted about in terms of a new approach to regulating, that potentially is quite an interesting way of, 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 of taking forward an adaptive management approach. So from that perspective, I think we would welcome that approach and we'd like to sit down with regulators and have more productive discussions about how we move it forward. I think we're in a consultation phase. I think we're open to, to, to um, um, suggestions and input from all sides on this one. Um, we're looking for the best way to improve the regulatory environment for fish farming and I, I think that we should, we should all try to do that. So uh, I think, Mr. Sanson, that the, the current consultation uh, suggests that this new DZR approach should be applied to fish farms that are expanding uh, in more exposed locations. Do you believe that this regulation should be applied to all fish farms, including existing fish farms in more inshore waters? I think there's a combination of things here. We we would. We obviously are doing, looking at this in relation to whether or not we can properly model and look at site-specific modelling that is more appropriate to the actual location of an existing site. Um, if we find that we've got a better model than the one that's been used in the past, or we can look at adding to that model and better understanding what's going on at site level, that's good. Um, we should do so that. So you would, you would welcome this new regulation being applied to every fish farm in, in Scotland, is that right? No. No, you would Because okay. there are some sites which... Um, as they're currently, as they're currently uh, uh, located, if you apply a strict interpretation of how it's presented at the moment, that would be detrimental to those, to those, to those sites. De detrimental to the sites or to the businesses that operate on those sites? Well, clearly, if it's detrimental to the site, it's detrimental to the business. So I I'm not going to try and, 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 and split hairs on that one. Um, the fact of the matter is we should take that into consideration if we're going to change the regulatory system. 
Okay, could I take other views um, on yeah. DZR? Uh, certainly, uh, at Link, our, our focus is really on the environmental impact and mitigating those impacts. So we have a new assessment in place, a new modelling technique that is more accurate and can give a, a more detailed um, view on the environmental impact, then that's the one we want to be seeing used. So if it's an improvement of previous models, then we would like to see this new improved model used on uh, all fish farms to, uh, to ensure that they're all fit meeting these new standards that are um, within this DZR uh, consultation. Thank you. The DZR works, is, is, is proposed to work, it's not approved yet, is to work by not using the existing um, idea of a, of a conservative limit on how much using biomass to limit the impact on the bottom or around. It's to say, let's not limit it. We won't have a cap on biomass. The farm's going to be 8,000 tonnes instead of 2,500 tonnes. But we'll work the way up to 8,000, monitor what the effect is, and then allow an increase, allow an increase, allow an increase till we detect an effect, which is supposed to be safe, and then we'll cap the, the capacity at that level. The problem with doing that is, as this SAMS report and PAMP2 study, all these studies have shown, is that the impacts are not immediately recognisable. You might find out 10 years later that there's been an impact because emamectin lives for four and a half years in the seabed and is still poisonous, for instance. And these things are cocktail effects. They accumulate. They bioaccumulate in animals. The, the computer modelling that drives DZR allows, in the case of Dooney, which isn't <coughs> offshore, by the way, it's one of the places they would have applied to DZR because it's dispersive. It allows the waste to go away. It allows 86% of the waste to leave, and then it's not modelled. So that's not really minimal impact. That's a discredited idea from the 1970s that you can dilute pollution until it doesn't make any difference anymore without knowing where it's gone. So DZR, adaptive management, is what's, as Mr. Sanderson has been saying, is what's been happening already. It's what's been going on before. It's not a new thing. It's like rebranding creationism as intelligent design. It's a, it's a marketing thing to say, we're going to do something different. We're going to be more intelligent about this. Whereas, in fact, what the intelligent bit is, is collecting proper data analysing it for, for patterns responsibly, independently, transparently, and then making sure that you apply the precautionary principle wherever you don't know the answer, which means now, and then work out what to do before you do it. You don't do what Professor Tett said and do it anyway and see what the effects are and then work out if you mind the effects afterwards, because you can't tell what the effects are for 10 years sometimes. Do, do, do you believe that there's anywhere in the world where that regulatory approach is successful in terms of delivering environmental objectives? I mean, Iceland was mentioned last week. They haven't started in Iceland. It's a proposal to do it from a blank slate in Iceland. Right. So if they do in Iceland what happens in the Faroes, which is where they have much less problems with sea lice, for instance, their DZR approach would be to say, we'll have zero tolerance of sea lice. So they kill them uh, if, if they kill all the fish if there are three sea lice per fish for three weeks. I mean that's that's adaptive management. That's quite an intelligent thing. But adaptive management is just a term for a broad idea of let's do it and see what happens. It's not a it's not a solution. It's a it's a re really vague term that doesn't mean anything. David Sanderson. I really don't think I can let that lie. Uh, this committee will obviously have a transcript of, of, of what's been said, and, and it's simply not true that in the Faroe Islands they kill all the fish if they've got more than three lies. I, I'm sorry, that's just not a fact. Well, I can give you the, the information. No, I can circulate this later on. Mark Roscoe, please continue. Um, I think I'm pretty much done. The, 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 the only to the last question I had on, on this is about whether there could be any unintended impacts of uh, pushing effectively fish farms out into more exposed locations on MPAs, but I think we've already had some commentary on MPAs, but as to what extent those are appropriately assessed. The, the more exposed location thing is, is a, um, it, the implication is they'll be far offshore and won't do anything and nobody will see them and it'll be solving many of the problems, but actually all, all that is required, the criteria for dispersive environment is strong currents. It could be the Pentland Firth, it could be the Sound of Jura, it could be the North Channel between Northern Ireland and Isla. It doesn't mean far away, and it, doesn't, it just means the stuff spread further. There's a model that just shows that sea lice from Argyle, from the mainland, can reach the Outer Hebrides. It's just been published this year. So that's a dispersive thing. Uh, just to add to that, um, some, a lot of the research is showing that some of these chemicals can have an impact at very low concentrations. And so when you move these farms into more exposed uh, environments, you then increase the footprint 
of an area that can be exposed to low concentrations. So really we need to know more about which chem chemicals are being used and in what quantities and what their impact is at low concentrations. I think Finlay Carson has got a brief supplementary on this issue. Uh, thanks, uh, Convener. Uh, it's, it's regarding uh, multitrophic aquaculture. Um, obviously, the, the salmon and in fishing industry wants to ensure that uh, as much of its resources can be put back into the system. So we, we see a, a huge level of nutrients being excreted by salmon that at the moment sit in the bottom of the sea. What sort of uh, research are, are you looking at into how that could be uh, reused and, and, and put back into the, the, the chain, if you like? As the scientists from SAMS um, um, <coughs> said last week, there is some some. Uh, hypotheses about this and in fact it, it actually looks like a, a good idea um, and in, in, in various locations where salmon farming takes place there are projects that have taken place looking at small scale um, um, uh, multi-trophic approaches so growing seaweeds and mussels and other other species in, in the vicinity <coughs> of a farm to get a balance in terms of nutrients within that environment at a local level, at a small level, I think it works very well indeed. And um, I think there's certainly a case that we should be looking to do some more research to see if we can expand that methodology. I don't think it's going to be um, what I'd call a big ticket in terms of changing the whole balance, but I think anything that um, can, can, can help aquaculture to be positive from that point of view, we should be looking at, uh, at, at doing more of. An example would be in the place I come from, the Shetland Isles, where we produce three quarters of the, the blue mussels in Scotland. They live quite happily in salmon farming areas and, and the coexistence of mussel farming and salmon farming is very productive. Just, uh, sorry, go on. Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to um, highlight in the SAMS report, when talking about multi-trophic multi approaches, there is this spatial disparity where in their report, they say one hectare of salmon farming requires 10 hectares of, I believe it was, uh, seaweed growth. So we're talking about huge areas of space that are required to have an effective approach, yeah, multi-trophic. I mean, I'm not saying they wouldn't have any effect or it's not a useful approach to look into, but at the moment, we're talking about huge areas of sea that would be required. Move this on, uh, Kate Forbes. Great, thank you very much. I'd like to move on to um, seals and acoustic deterrent devices. So firstly, on uh, lethal control measures related to seals, um, the report states that although the present licensing system has resulted in a decline in the number of seal shooting licenses issued, there are several areas where additional attention is required. And it looks at, for example, the reintroduction of closed seasons for shooting corresponding to the main nursing periods for seals. What measures do you think are necessary to um, ensure uh, that any welfare concerns around the shooting of seals is, um, is dealt with? Um, certainly, uh, Link would discourage the use of shooting seals as a predator management control. We think there are alternative methods uh, that are available, such as tension nets that can uh, resolve many of these problems. Um, sorry, John, if I may. Um, there's no real way to make it sound good if you have to shoot a seal. So therefore, we're not going to um, um, try to play the numbers game. Um, however, the numbers that we, we, we are, have driven this down to are very low indeed, and we've stated that we intend to continue to drive them down towards zero by deploying whatever methodologies we possibly can before we have to resort to using a license to shoot a seal. The numbers are very low indeed. We're into single figures per quarter. Um, however, from time to time, a seal will actually be inside a, 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 a cage of fish, and it's, it's predating on the stock. It's extremely difficult to do anything other than those circumstances. Um, all the measures that we're talking about, whether it be tension nets, predator nets, ADDs, etc., etc., are all part of the of the of, of the canvas we work on. And um, in relation to ADDs and whether they're appropriate, in some cases they are. The idea that they're left on continuously and have a massive effect on other other marine mammals, I would refute because they're used selectively. Um, they're not they're not switched on willy-nilly. They use when there's a problem. Uh, so, can I pull you up on that? There was an FOI request from 2016 that indicates that 60% in, in the case of salmon farms using ADDs, 60% 
are listed as having these always on. That's surely at odds with what you've just said, with respect. That doesn't concur with my knowledge of the situation, but I would need to take that away and look at the FOI to see if, see if I can shed any light on that. Okay. That's not my knowledge of how industry practice operates at the moment. Because you would recognise it's not appropriate to weave ADDs on on a permanent basis. Well, we recognise that there's an impact on, a potential impact on marine cetaceans uh, within, within a certain zone around those farms, and therefore you'd have to use those appropriately. Okay. Sorry, Mr Colin. Widen the um, point and then I'll bring you sure. in. Um, a comment from Marine Scotland in 2011 said that despite being a licensed condition, most so shot seals are not presently made available for necropsy, thereby preventing an independent assessment of whether seals are shot according to the Scottish Seal Management Code of Practice and in such a manner to ensure against a prolonged and painful death. But at the thing is, I think just to stop shooting seals and it would solve all these problems, and the industry needs to anyway if it wants to sell salmon to America. And that's coming quite soon because the Americans are changing the rules. So it, it seems like a no-brainer. Just, just don't do it anymore. If there are so few being shot that it makes no difference, if it's single figures in quarters, then it's how many is that a year? It's nothing. So just stop doing it. Um, ADDs are not proven to work, it says in the Sam's report. They're unmonitored. The council say they can't regulate them. They're expanding because the industry is expanding, and the effect is cumulative. And they exclude porpoises from seven, in a seven and a half kilometre radius around one farm. Porpoises are protected species. This happens in SACs, the, the SAC for porpoise in the in the Minches and Firth of Lawn. So, you know, mobile species they can swim away. It's just nonsense. Um, can, I, can yeah. I just quickly add to that that you know, although Mr. Sanderson said that there's not a lot of evidence on the impact on cetaceans, there is a growing body of evidence on the impact on harbour porpoises mm -hmm. in that they induce stress, they uh, cause hearing damage, and they uh, cause displacement. They change the behaviour of uh, harbour porpoises, restricting them from going to certain areas. So there is a growing body of evidence that ADDs, although not proven to be pro uh, effective on seals, do have a significant impact on cetaceans. So suggesting we should just not deploy them or de uh, deploy them selectively? Um, I think I'd go back to my previous answer where there are alternatives such as uh, tension nets that we would prefer to be used and the use of ADDs to be discouraged as much as possible. Okay. So uh, why are tension nets not used more? more? Could I maybe just Sorry. clarify that? Farms use all these things, net tension systems and ADDs together. It's not one or the other. They, they, these things are all available for, for us to use, depending on what the most appropriate things are for the environment we're in and the, and the, the type of predator involved interaction that we have. So it'll, it'll not be the, a single solution for all locations because we don't need a single solution for all locations. We need to know what's most appropriate for those locations. Um, I, I think, I think we, we've, we've quite clearly stated that, that we'll, we'll do everything we can to stop having to go and use a licence to shoot a seal. And yes, it's simple to say, let's just stop doing it. Well, we are stopping doing it. And we do know that there's a threat to, to certain markets if we don't comply with their requirements. So we've got to take acknowledgement of that and we'll drive those numbers right down. How could you propose better um, monitoring of ADD? So if there's I conflict, think... for example, about how often they're on continuously, etc. Uh, yeah, how would you better monitor it? The problem that it's very, you know, they shouldn't be used because they can't be monitored. That's the, that's the difficulty. How do you monitor them? They're not monitored at the moment because it's very difficult to monitor them. So they shouldn't be, S and H have a role in deciding whether they should be or shouldn't be used. But they are used in places like that SAC, um, even though there is a role. Basically, S and H are ignored most of the time. But there must be a means of um, identifying their uses because that FOI request appears to provide the evidence, which presumably came from the farms themselves, which conflicts with Mr Sanderson's position that he doesn't recognise those figures. I think it might be useful if you came back to us on that, because there's clearly an issue here. I certainly will come back to you, and, and I'm sorry if I'm, um, I'm not aware of that information. Um, however, um, we, we're, we're the best people to tell you what's happening on farms, and we have absolutely no reason not to. So I think... Um, Whichever agency needs to know that information, I think our industry would quite happily freely give that information, and then we can make decisions about whether that's the appropriate use of ADDs. 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on uh, briefly to RAS, Finlay Carson. Thanks. Uh, I believe that there are some concerns over the exploitation of, of RAS populations and, and potentially that, that will get worse as, as the, the, the farming scale increases. Will the industry uh, be able to achieve its targets of cultivating RAS uh, that it uses uh, by uh, 2019? And if it doesn't, do you believe that the wild fisheries for RAS uh, requires more regulation? Okay, um, two parts to that maybe. Um, the first part is that um, we've already started to make the big investments necessary in the hatchery facilities required to grow the numbers of RAS that we believe we, we could usefully use in, in the marine environment. The latest one being the um, approval to go ahead with a, a new hatchery at Macrahanish with a, a 14 million pound investment there. We believe that we'll have enough RAS in production by 2019 to meet our needs. If we don't, then we're quite happy to engage with whoever we need to about voluntary measures in terms of the existing RAS fishery now, not in 2019, to make sure that we're not actually doing anything at all which might impact on the overall sustainability of that fishery. Yep, um, I'd like to pick up on just the, the cultivation question, oh, and well, both points really. Um, certainly when we're talking about cultivation, the number of RAS or lump sucker fish required, uh, to meet the demands of the industry. We're talking about a whole new form of aquaculture, really, a whole new um, RAS and lump sucker fishery, which requires resources, which requires food, which will require pest management as well. Um, and over time, if we're cultivating these uh, species, we're going to have some genetic traits chosen over others, the same as we have with farm salmon, where they're more adapted or better at reducing sea lice numbers. And uh, this raises concerns, for example, if you were to have a large-scale uh, escape of uh, uh, farmed salmon, you also have an escape of farmed cleaner fish too, which then go into the wild population. And we have similar problems that we see with wild salmon escapes on the wild populations there. Um, certainly, going forward, there will be a, um, a need to uh, fish wild wrasse, uh, even if it's to broodstock uh, the cultivation of cleaner fish. And certainly we've seen RAS numbers drop. We've seen actions already take place in the so south of England through the IFCAs to introduce management plans over great concern that the RAS numbers are dropping. So we certainly need more information on stock assessments, catch sizes, RAS behaviour to try and identify catch limits uh, and uh, manage it as a fishery. Um, could I come out as well? The Macrahanish thing is going to produce a million fish. Um, it takes a year and a half to grow them, 40 million pounds. The predicted demand in the SAMS report is 10 million fish, a 400 million pound investment to produce the farmed ones. Are they really going to put 400 million pounds into farming wrasse? And the reason for doing all this is because the wrasse eat the sea lice, so it's back to the sea lice problem again. Closed containment fixes that problem completely, no sea lice. If you put RAS in a cage to, to do this and they pick up disease from the salmon, you have then to do something with the RAS at the end of the production cycle. So every 20 months, they kill all the fish, all the RAS. In, that's the plan. In Norway, they're released. I assume it's the case here. Is it, are they all going to be killed in Scotland? They are. OK, they're all going to be killed in Scotland. So is that sustainable? I mean, they're taking a large proportion of those from the wild, moving them up the country, potentially their disease, and then you kill them all as a byproduct of producing salmon. It's not sustainable. Let's, we've covered a, a very wide ranging uh, number of topics today, but let's conclude this session by looking at the issue of mitigation. Ali Crowley. I'm quite struck that, that in, the, in the report itself, and I'd like to just quote this, this paragraph here, it says, recirculating aquaculture systems, RES, might seem a logical solution to many of the environmental problems associated with salmon farming. By isolating fish from the natural environment, RES provides security from disease, infestation and predators and eliminate the risk of harming wild salmon. By retaining waste, they prevent organic and nutrient impacts on the environment. So, when I read that, I thought to myself, there, therein, therein lies the solution to this. Um, and I see, I see that there's a Norwegian firm announced plans for a £500 million investment in uh, an aquaculture uh, plant inland 
land based in, in America. So, so it certainly seems to be that there is investment taking place. Here. Is, it, is, that, is that the solution? Is that the, the big ticket, as you said? Um, if I may, um, I, uh, in terms of the big ticket, I, I, I would view that as being something for the future. Um, in addition to what we do in the marine environment and supplementing what we do in the marine environment and enhancing what we do in the marine environment, um, if we look at the, um, the, the footprint of what we do now in the marine environment and try to supplant that into a complete, a complete change of, of tack and going into um, uh, land-based recirculating aquaculture systems, the carbon footprint and the physical footprint of that would be out of all proportion to anything we can, we can think of here. The actual, it's in the report, it shows you the, the, the comparators between carbon footprint from a marine farm operation comparative to a, 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 a land-based one. And it's a, a factor of 1,400% more in terms of carbon footprint. Now, we farm in the sea extremely efficiently. We have an ex excellent efficiency ratio in terms of how we produce really healthy protein. Trying to then balance that with the impact we would have on land with the, the consent required and the space required and the footprint required to do that, it's not even worth starting to think about. However, if we're going to expand in the future, we should develop what we're already doing with the, 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 the recirculating aquaculture systems for smoke production and try to build on that. And no doubt there will be people who will look commercially at that equation and say, at some scale or other, we can start to build land-based aquaculture facilities. If we're going to feed the planet, we're going to have to find ways to do it. And that's definitely not off the table altogether in my book. But it isn't the big ticket in terms of solving all the problems. Um, a lot of the problems that we have in the industry, we believe we can solve them. We have, we have the ability to, to face up to those challenges to invest in innovation, to try to find new solutions. And I don't think that we should abandon the way we farm at the moment to supplant it with something else. John Aitchison. Thank you. The thing is with that, that that's, you know, that's fine. There is a problem maybe with the amount of energy involved in doing containment on land. But the, what that does is conflate one problem with, with the next problem. The first problem is it's cheaper to farm salmon in the sea because the sea is used as a free waste disposal for all the pollution. If you, if you pay for the pollution, which every other industry has to do, every other industry has to do that, then it costs what it costs in Norway. And Norway are moving completely, even marine harvest in Norway say it's necessary to move to containment, to complete separation of fish from the sea. Because they're an environmental country, they, they do carbon audits on everything, and they think that the risk is greater of farming open nets than closed containment. Even Trump's America's doing it in Maine. I mean, for goodness sake. So we can't carry on like we're doing. We should fix the problems that exist now and then not expand until we've worked out how to fix the problems. It's a precautionary principle. We're obliged to do that. Sam Cohen. Yeah. Well, I certainly think that um, close containment technology has huge potential for um, alleviating a lot of these problems. And obviously that comes with other environmental concerns, but there needs to be some clear cost-benefit analysis done to co adequately compare these two uh, different approaches. Um, but what is disappointing is that there is a huge amount of investment in this technology in other countries like Norway, and there doesn't seem to be anything happening here, no, uh, pilot projects, um, anything. Um, and I think we, are, we recognize that this is an early stage of the technology and that we can't expect it to happen tomorrow. But there are a lot of other technologies out there at the moment that involve some kind of semi-closed containment through uh, maintain, keeping fish at certain depths to reduce the sea lice problem. Uh, there are other things happening out there that aren't being investigated or put into use here in Scotland. Um, so there are many interim methods and strategies that could be put into place uh, whilst we're waiting for close containment technology to become an economically viable option. I, I, and to, to back that up to an extent, um, those techno the technology around close containment is transferable. So the, should we, if we're going to invest in Scotland, it should be on all those kind of measures and others will develop th those technologies that we can import. Scotland yes. should lead the way. Hey, Scotland's behind. We're on the back foot. Norway's leading this. Are we wanting to be as cheap as Chile and compete on that basis that we're cheaper and making a lot? Or should we raise the standards and compete on being the best? Scotland's good at this stuff. It's good at engineering. Ali Crowley, do you want to come back with further questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, Donald Cameron, then John Scott. Thank you, Kavina. Thank you, I, mean, I think um, what I'm hearing from you all is that, it, realistically speaking, the SAMS report is right when it concludes, and I quote, 
it seems likely that the majority of salmon production in the sea will, for the foreseeable future, continue to take place in net pens. I mean, I think that um, seems to be what, what, what everyone s says. I've got a question for Mr. Sanderson, and, this, and it is this. It, it, it would be much more expensive, would it not, for your industry to commit to recirculation systems than what you're currently doing, it's, it, it's financially speaking? I, I like the idea of a cost-benefit analysis. Um, I'm sure we need to do that. Um, we, 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 we are really up for innovation. We're really up for trying different growing systems in the sea. We don't have a problem with closed containment systems being applied in the sea. Even, even looking at how we can implement effluent treatment within those systems, we already have substantial investment in well boats for um, carrying out an awful lot of the, f the rudimentary work that we need to do farm on, on farm sites in terms of moving fish and treating fish. Um, we, can, we, can now, we can now have effluent treatment built into those well boat systems. We can have capture and filtration systems built into those systems. Yes, we, we're investing heavily in all these things and we're moving forward the whole time in terms of investment. So there's always a cost-benefit analysis required whenever you take any decision about how to move forward. And I'm not suge suggesting for one minute that we're going to stand still I, and not all, do that. All I'm, I, I hope it's not a controversial point to make, but it, surely it is cheaper for you to do this at sea in open nets than in closed containment. Is that right? Yes. John Scott, followed by Mark Russell, to conclude. Thank you. Uh, coming from an engineering background, I would like to see an engineering solution to much of what you propose. At the moment, there is nothing happening in terms of the deposition in the seabed, and the alternative is close containment. In between, there must lie an engineering solution, which would essentially be that as fish cages are suspended, are they not in the water? Then something similar to a tree of a similar dimension could be suspended beneath it and cleaned out on a regular basis. In agriculture, you had old things like dung spreaders or the conveyor belt, which moved all the stuff to one end, you put it into a pipe, suck it out onto a ship, and away you go with it, clean it out once a week. Why would you not be doing something similar to that in terms of innovation? It's an engineering solution. I don't believe it's an impractical uh, thought, and I cannot understand why it hasn't actually already been developed as an idea and, and clear off the mess that causes so much problems with seabed with the ivermectins and in, in lasting for a long time in that environment take it away and dispose of it in a proper manner thereafter why not uh, as I've just said, i believe uh, it's happening in norway there's research going on into this but maybe you'll tell me more about it in, um, there are methods which is heard recently in tasmania where they use a kind of funnel underneath the the salmon farm which apparently catches up to 60 to 70 percent of the waste, and then that's funneled out, and part of that's converted into fertilizer, yeah, and the rest is a treated. big start. Could, could, we, could we ask, could I ask, how much money industry and the government puts into researching close containment in Scotland? Because there's a trial at Macrahanish run by a Norwegian company that's concluded, I think successfully, but there's almost no information about it, doing exactly this on land. So are we investing in it? I, what I heard was Marine Scotland said we're watching with interest. That was their submission to the Salmon and Trout Conservation petition to this committee previously. Watching with interest. Are they paying for it? Is anybody putting money in? Mr. Sands. If I could come back to, to what you've asked about in terms of an engineering solution, um, again, I would reiterate the fact that as an industry, we're absolutely 100% committed to innovation in all areas of our operations. There are a number of things going on already in terms of engineering solutions. None of them have been have been brought through to be fully commercial, fully implemented in terms of becoming mainstream in terms of how we deal with problems, because they're not proven yet. Um, there, there are some systems out there that you can buy off the shelf, lift up systems, ways in which you can capture some of the, the effluents from f farming operations, and indeed some of them are in use in Scotland already. In our operations, there are significant attempts to try to minimise the amounts of, of, of things that we're uh, effectively better off treating if we, can, if we can do so. And I think we will look for the technology. We will look for an engineering solution. Um, the, the, the solution's not there yet, but there's nothing to stop us from actually working towards that. Before I take the final question, can I just point out for the record that the Salmon and Trout petition was actually lodged with the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. I just note that for the record before the convener of that committee seeks to point it out, perhaps. <laughs> Mark Ruskell. 
So it appears that the main concern with closed containment systems is the energy that's required. Um, but with open pens, we have the problem of nutrient waste. Is there not a way that we can take nutrient waste that would be captured with closed containment systems and maybe put that through anaerobic digestion and actually generate the energy? And, and do you know of any research that's uh, currently underway along, along those lines? Which one would be the one to look at? And the Norwegians say a study was done in Norway that proved it was economically equal to farming open nets in the sea, done by a Norwegian university. So yeah. it's um, worth having a look. All I would say to that is that there are a number of um, um, attempts at, at, at land-based closed containment out there that have been done over the years. Some have, some have come to conclusions, some are still happening. I think the committee would be well advised to find out as much information as possible about those systems and the exact outcomes of some of that uh, work to date. Um, the only other issue that I've, I've not touched on in terms of how we would see how what we do in the sea supplants into a land-based a land -based system would be in the relation to whether or not it improves the overall well-being and, and health and welfare of our fish. Um, we, would, we would say that um, it's more than likely that the stock densities in some of these experiments that have been done around the world already would be significantly higher than the stock densities that we farm fish in the sea. For your sea wise, presumably. Let's wrap it up at that point. Can I thank uh, all of the witnesses for their time this morning? I think that's been a very useful exercise in exploring the various issues. Uh, I'm going to suspend very briefly for five minutes till we change the panel. Thank you for your time.
Started, please. I'll restart it. Uh, welcome back to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We will now take evidence on the environmental impacts of salmon farming in Scotland from our second panel. I'd like to welcome Anne Anderson from SEPA, Mark Harvey from Highland Council, uh, Mark McKee from Marine Scotland and Rob Raynard uh, from Marine Scotland. Um, as you will understand, we've got a series of questions uh, for you. Um, I want to look at how things have progressed or otherwise since 2002. In two regards, perhaps, as you may have heard us asking the first question, perhaps you could get all you straight for the, the benefit of the committee. Examples of where the precautionary principle has been deployed in the expansion of this sector. And also to look at the issue of regulation, because it, it strikes me that we have fish farms leasing the seabed from the Crown Estate. They obtain planning consent from the local authority. They're then policed by SEPA and the Fish Health Inspectorate. And yet there does appear at face value to be an insufficient coherence of oversight of their activities. So are we regulating sufficiently, sufficiently effectively? So we could take those questions together and, and kick off with those. Could I? Mark Harvey. Can I start? On the precautionary principle, um, precautionary principle, of course, is uh, embedded in European environmental legislation, so we, we, we obviously can't, can't ignore it. It's a, it's a principle that's applied. Um, I have to say, speaking as a planner, I don't like it. Um, I don't like it as an approach because I think we're actually paid to take decisions, and those decisions, in my case, obviously are are we recommending approval or are we recommending refusal for definite, clear, evidenced reasons um, and not because we're not sure, so we don't feel like taking a decision. Um, that said, um, just to wind myself back a little, um, we have recently started to use environmental management plans. They were mentioned earlier, um, and those are uh, they're embedded as conditions within planning permissions. They're a, um, a method of engaging with the industry over time, so they're a monitoring condition, effectively, and they allow us to uh, involve ourselves in the lifetime of the consent, which may be considerable, um, in terms of monitoring such things as, uh, as sea lice control and, um, uh, and escapes. Um, and I would say that that is very much a sort of precautionary approach. It's, it's not the hard enforcement that planning authorities are often in where there's a clear parameter set. If it's breached, it's enforced against um, uh, in, in a clearly defined manner. It's, it's a sort of softer approach. And I would, I would suggest that that is probably at the moment where the precautionary principle is, is coming in most clearly. And in terms of regulation of the sector, is it sufficient given what we've seen in this report? Um, it is sufficient. It, it's difficult. Um, I, I came into this job, this responsibility a couple of years ago um, from a, a development management background, enforcement background. Um, I think this is probably as difficult a job as the a local authority, planning authority, uh, a difficult, as difficult a sector as as it has to deal with in any, anything else. Um, and yeah, I, my, my feeling is that the, the regulations are, are quite, from a planning authority point of view, quite frustrating. Um, and we don't feel we've, um, we're able to come up with very clear answers um, as recommendations to our committees and so forth. Consequently, the environmental management plan is that slightly soft-edged uh, approach to monitoring as opposed to perhaps the more hard-edged monitoring that we would apply to other uh, areas of, uh, of our work. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anne Anderson. Um, in terms of uh, SEPA's role uh, in licensing, uh, we set um, environmental quality standards. Um, so in, in respect to the precautionary approach, there are controls, um, Mark, referring to, to the style of uh, controls that are used within the planning regime. Within the CAR uh, consent uh, regime, uh, we set environmental quality standards that protect outside a zone of impact. Um, and those standards relate both to organic and to chemical loads. Um, they are uh, used in terms of a baseline. 
So in terms of the application process, there is a baseline assessment required, and we use modelling tools to predict um, environmental impact, um, setting the limits in terms of size and scale based on uh, those predictions. Um, monitoring is then undertaken in respect to compliance with those levels, uh, both uh, the uh, limits in terms of size and scale of the, the facility, but also in terms of the environmental monitoring and the outputs from uh, what's known as benthic analysis, uh, also chemical residue sampling. Um, largely done uh, by the operators and SEPA undertakes a compliance and auditing um, uh, monitoring programme undertaking sampling and analysis um, for, uh, in respect to sort of compliance and audit checks. Um, so in terms of precautionary, it is set at the uh, where the environment, so every environmental quality standard is set through the use of EU directive, uh, specifically within this industry in respect to water framework directive, and we're currently going through a process of assessing uh, and improving um, the EQS in respect to MMX and Benzoate, which has been previously mentioned. Um, in respect to standards, they're actually set where, in the absence of, you go to the um, environment and to protect the environment. So in terms of risk factors, they're set specifically uh, where there is any uncertainty for a higher level of a uh, factor <coughs> and therefore a tighter control. I think um, David Sanderson mentioned that earlier in terms of Scotland's environmental controls within uh, the fish farming industry. Thank you. So can I clarify a point you made? That you said that, that largely the sector provides a lot of the, the information, the data for the monitoring. Could you quantify that? I mean, to what extent does SEPA do its own independent monitoring and analysis as opposed to not being based on what you're being told by the sector? So, um, as an environmental regulator, we regulate the sector in the same way as we do every other environmental activity, be it land um, or water-based. Um, the predominant um, theme is that there is operator monitoring, uh, reporting of that, and then we have a uh, resource that is then allocated against the findings. The, the actual percentage I don't have in front of me, but I will provide that. But, it, but in effect, wouldn't the industry actually have to self-incriminate itself in order to be regulated? Yeah, in, in essence, um, we require, there is a requirement to uh, notify of analysis being undertaken. That allows us a window of time to then do an audit of that analysis, and that does occur. Um, there also is the ability then for us to then go and undertake those additional audits. Uh, last year we did a programme in Shetland over an eight week period, um, specifically assessing around our capability uh, in terms of the future regime um, reference made earlier to DZR, which is actually enhancing the volume of uh, monitoring and the type of analysis that has been undertaken in the industry. So in terms of providing additional um, sound science and scientific evidence, uh, the, the, the monitoring protocols are likely to be changing um, through the course of uh, this year and into next. So there's no programme of unannounced visits across the sector, is there? There is, as a regulator, that's how we undertake our business, is predominantly um, unannounced. Um, and uh, either inspection at the facility. So not all our regulatory activity is down to scientific sampling and analysis. There is other uh, means of tracking use of um, medicines, feed uh, quantities. Um, so there's a range of different regulatory tools that we take in respect to uh, monitoring and regulating this so sector, just as with others. To develop our understanding of how this works in practice, how often, how, how, so how Perhaps more fairly, how many unannounced um, visits would be made annually across Scotland, across its fish farms? Again, I don't have the figures right in front of me, but I will provide you with the details of that. This is a risk-based assessment that we take in terms of inspections and announcements. Um, there are uh, approximately about 400 uh, licensed marine cage fish farms. Any one time, there's about 290 to 300 in operation. Um, and then it's, it's a, it, there is a programme of inspections, uh, which also includes uh, that sampling in an analytical capacity, as well as the, the, the regulatory uh, role. I shall provide you with the full details. OK, thanks. James McKay, do you want to come in here? Um, yes, I think the, our position, from my regulatory position, is slightly easier in the sense that we operate in a complementary way to uh, the main regulators being SEPA and the Council. 
um, in terms of how we would see um, reacting to a situation where perhaps you'd have to undertake an investigation. Uh, yes, indeed, it, it, it is dependent on the um, timely submission of information at key points in time that allows you to take cons into consideration whether you would need to then take any, any particular investigative action or take any further consideration. Rob Reynard, in terms of the role of the Fish Health Inspectorate, um, isn't it a bit bizarre that you would look inside the cage but not outside it? And I realise you work to the rules that you work to, but looking at it from a layman's perspective, should that not be part of the regime that you follow, looking at the impacts immediately outside those cages? Uh, well, I mean, since 2002, the big change in fish health has been um, the aquatic animal health regs, uh, 2009. Uh, there is a focus um, around the biosecurity on the farm. Um, that legislation covers a number of uh, listed and notifiable diseases. And in relation to those diseases, where we find them, we do look outside the farm into whether wild fish uh, have been affected by those diseases, or indeed whether the presence in wild fish might um, impede or um, have a bearing on how we treat the farm to eliminate the disease. That's for the list of diseases that are part of the EU uh, framework that's implemented in Scotland. Um, it requires authorization of farms, um, very specific measures that farms have to have in place, specifically around the biosecurity, uh, record keeping, disinfection, the way in which they stock farms, and, and they specifically have to address how the uh, veterinary assistance that is called on in times of disease will be made available to individual sites. Um, so there is, there is a, a remit outside the farm with regard to that, um, but it's not, it's not a big part of, of the work. Uh, the other big change uh, since 2002 is, of course, um, the Agriculture and Fisheries Scotland Act. Um, and 2007, and, and latterly uh, 13. Um, in relation to that, again, um, it's very much focused in the farm. Uh, in relation to escapes, it does give some um, a reference to uh, the ability to trace escapes uh, outside farms. So that is, that is part of, of that. Um, and the other thing, yeah, the coming back to the aqua, uh, animal health regs, um, you know, one of the biggest threats that we have in Scotland to the Scottish wild salmon is, of course, uh, exotic disease, um, particularly a particular threat from uh, a parasite called Gyrodactylus salaris is um, eliminated at the moment through the measures we have in place to prevent uh, risk of import through trade. Uh, so that both enhances um, or protects, entirely protects uh, all stocks, both farmed and wild, in Scotland from that particular parasite. So that's an example where the powers we have uh, do, cross, do cross boundaries for, for actual listed diseases. Is there not a risk that you all do your own thing and we end up with a system that does not regulate an industry in the way it might most appropriately regulate it? I think um, in, in relation to my own area of uh, fish health, um, certainly through the Programme for Government's uh, development of the um, farm fish uh, strategic health framework, um, that involves uh, a number of regulators um, to, deliver, to deliver an optimisation of an improvement in the overall fish health in Scotland that involves SEPA as well as um, Marine Scotland. And there are other, there are other examples where, uh, in, in, in relation to the um, EMPs, the environmental monitoring programs that were discussed, the, there's, a, there's a reliance on science uh, within those programs because industry will have to demonstrate um, that they aren't having an impact. And science is, in very, science is very important for that. And as, 
although it's not a fish health inspector aspect, if I may, in relation to marine scotland science, there is relevant work that we draw on. In the fish health inspectorate, we rely on um, scientific knowledge to make risk-based and, de and evidence-based decisions. So <clears throat> just in relation to the work we're doing on the wider aspects, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we've, had, we've got a long-term program of research that's looking at the uh, distribution of wild salmon and the migratory routes. Um, and, and we can use this to inform, together with information on the location of lice in the environment, we can inform uh, a planning process or inform the planning process through that knowledge. Um, it's, not, it's not a finished area. I think uh, Sam's referred to at least a 10-year program uh, to get there, uh, but we started on it. And there are several reports, there's uh, several published peer-reviewed reports that aren't in the Sam's report, probably because they focus more on the um, coexistence of the sectors um, uh, and, and being able to um, advise on planning. But um, we've developed tools for the monitoring of lice in the environment, um, the, the migratory routes uh, of salmon and sea trout. And we have evidence of, in relation to settlement and impacts on individual trout, and that's, that's available. Um, we don't yet, we're not that yet there in terms of understanding how we take that to a population impact. Um, and there's uh, research which is uh, recently, well, started about three years ago through the Scottish Aquaculture Research Forum funding, which aims to identify impacts um, on, on wild salmon. Okay. Right. Yeah. Anna Anderson. To add in, um, in, in respect to um, our own controls, uh, we've been, we would be unable to operate without having close dialogue with Marine Scotland. Um, quite. The, the link between fish health and the use of medicines. Um, so as, a, as an environmental protection agency, um, always to try and reduce the impact on the environment, be it either organic loading or chemical loading, uh, working with them in respect to the fish health and changes. Therefore, it's quite integral, particularly with some of the techniques that we're referring to, and the potential, therefore, to ensure that um, what we uh, put into any car licence doesn't then lend itself uh, to perverse practice is relevant uh, for ourselves as much as it is for any other regulator um, sitting at this table in terms of the interdependencies between each of the regulatory uh, strands of work. Thank okay, you. before I open this out to colleagues, just, just one kind of wrap-up question. As regulatory practitioners, are there any gaps in regulation that you can see that require to be filled for the benefit of the environment? Mark. Well, I, th I think the most obvious one from our point of view is is the protection of wild fish, uh, particularly in in respect of sea lice. Um, as as the as the planning authority, we're, we're generally content to rely on the, the other regulators and their work on, on on disease control, on the health of the fish, and obviously inside the pens, um, and in, in terms of uh, the benthic modelling and deposition of uh, uh, of material around the cage. Um, that's that's as as, as uh, comprehensive a regulatory um, procedure as we, we would deal with in other areas, but it does seem to it seems to us that the the issue of the externalised impact on um, wild fish uh, through sea lice is something that we've had to um, actually move ourselves as a as a planning authority forward on, simply to satisfy ourselves that that that, that, that something is being done. Uh, which sort of takes us back to the precautionary principle, in order to avoid having to say, well, we can't take a decision here because we just don't know. Uh, we've, we've had to move that one on. Um, and I think that's, from our point of view, that is a, 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 a problem that's, that's shared with, with Marine Scotland. Marine Scotland are a, a, a consultee for us, but of course are not in a position to um, uh, support or object on sea lice impacts on wild fish because that scientific um, data is, is, is not there in order to allow them to defend that should it be challenged. Okay, right, interesting, thanks. Okay, let's open this out uh, on fish health and mortality, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. So you'll have heard, um, as we did, the comments from the earlier panel about the level and the cause of um, fish mortality. 
What would your response be to those comments? In terms of the extent of um, fish mortality? So perhaps I could uh, kick off with that. Um, that was from, from the panel this morning. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, although if I could widen and, it further. Um, what is your view on uh, the, the level and the cause of fish mortality? OK. Um, well, with regard to the level, I think, uh, I'm not excusing this, but with, an, with any livestock production, uh, there will be health challenges. Um, and the, obviously, the agriculture industry is no different to that. The, the causes of the mortality, um, we don't have absolute um, rigorous scientific evidence attributable to every um, event and every cause, but I can summarize what we do know, and that is, uh, last time we looked at this in detail through a cross-section involving one big company, uh, we showed that about one-third of mortalities are caused by infectious disease, um, and two-thirds were caused by other causes, uh, particularly challenging uh, and in relation to what David Sanderson was saying, um, harmful um, algae, plank uh, phytoplankton, microscopic ph phytoplankton that uh, damage the gills and cause irritation of the gills. Likewise, um, <coughs> quite unpredictable jellyfish blooms as well, um, which can cause uh, fish health issues, as well as other events such as storms. Um, in recent times, the mortality has increased, um, and I would agree that um, the complex between the gill health challenges and and the, and the bath treatments associated with those uh, uh, ring with our, what David said about those ring with our experience, um, that the, the mortalities might not be necessarily attributable to a, a, a classical infectious agent, but are a complex mix of environmental factors, including uh, the presence of um, a para amoeba, um, which uh, is associated with the gill health problems. And that's a natural amoeba. Um, we don't precisely know where it comes from, um, but it has been found to um, grow on the surfaces of um, farm equipment. So it could be that there's a, there's a place in the environment for this naturally, and that it's um, found an opportunistic uh, place in, in farm salmon. But that's a a key thing. In terms of the infectious agents, uh, we see uh, some viral diseases, um, particularly uh, uh, resulting in some heart problems in fish. And of course, you mentioned the synergy between different problems. If, if fish have, if fish are affected by uh, heart issues then, and the gills are also affected, then it puts a respiratory challenge on the fish. Um, I would also agree that um, the availability of the veterinary advice, and, and this is another thing that's changed since 2002, um, the availability of uh, specialised fish vets has expanded massively. We've got laboratories that support them. Um, so the industry do have access to vets who are obviously have a, an ethical um, obligation uh, for the care of the welfare of the animals. So that aspect is um, certainly covered in terms of the legislation. Does anybody else have any comments? Could, I, could just come in from the, from the planning authority point of view, the actual the, the mortality rate, um, hard though it is to say, is, will not be a material consideration for the planning authority in, in making its decision. Um, there's enough... Uh, Positive. Obviously, we take our decisions in reference to policy, national and local, and there's certainly enough positive um, policy um, uh, in existence to, to suggest that um, uh, uh, the, the industry as a whole, the, 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 uh, the, the whole setup of, um, uh, uh, of aquaculture, is something that the, uh, 
uh, the government wants to support and local authorities should support it. So consequently, it's, it's not one of, those, uh, one of those factors that we would take into account there. Alec Crow within Mark Roscoe. Could I, just on that point, you made about the material consideration. Would the material consideration be, however, that we've seen that the, the level of mortality was around the 90s and 2000s, 20% of, of, of fish stock, and that's risen in recent times up to possibly 25%. How that's disposed of, um, so we, we, we see the lorry runs, as, or is it the fish runs, salmon runs, as they call them, we, the lorry loads of dead fish, millions of fish that are, that are being, being killed. Is that a material consideration when, when, when looking at planning? Uh, I, it, it could be. It's not one that's been, been raised with us, but I, th I think if, if it was raised that we needed to think carefully about how uh, dead fish would be moved from the site um, and uh, you know, presumably through the road system, um, I'd certainly be looking for a uh, you know, comment from my uh, roads colleagues in Transport Scotland, perhaps, on, on the appropriate way of doing that, um, and other regulators, if indeed the, the transport of, uh, of dead fish you know, raised other regulatory issues. It's not something that's been done so far, but I think that, that would be material because it has a, obviously a, a physical impact on the, on the road system um, or, or, or raises other issues. Rob Maynard. Uh, yeah, um, Marine Scotland Science, the Fish Health Inspectorate are a, a statutory consultee in the planning process and in relation to our responses with regard to our um, responsibilities on fish health, we will um, be you know, taking account of whether the farm has in place um, the provision for uh, dealing with uh, large-scale mortalities. And indeed, on the authorisation process that we undertake with the farm through the biosecurity measures plan, they do have to have in place um, protocols and procedures for how they will be handling mortalities. In, in fact, removing mortalities also from the cages. In, in terms of the environmental effect, um, the farms are removing mortalities um, on a very regular basis, and that's of course is is minimising um, pathogens going into the environment. In relation to the impacts on wild fish, which is referred to in the um, SAMS report from disease, we take a slightly different interpretation to themselves on the Wallace uh, 2017 paper, which. We interpret as, um, and it was conducted by Marine Scotland Science, uh, we interpret that as um, including a lot of uh, very structured surveys that provided the evidence that, in actual fact, the um, impact of infectious disease on wild fish was, was likely to be very minimal. And on that basis, we've actually um, focused our resources onto trying to understand um, the sea lice interactions as, as being a more beneficial use of the resources that we've got available. Well, thank you, Convener. Good, good morning, Joel. Could I just take up the issue uh, which my colleague Alex uh, Riley hi highlighted about the transportation and disposal of um, dead fish, uh, which is particularly important in view of the amount of mortalities that's been um, discussed this morning, and ask any of you as regulators or as a local authority, um, whether you have a view on whether those, um, the regulations and the protocols and the possibilities of um, prosecution and enforcement are appropriate. And I just refer you to an FOI which um, produced evidence about um, something that I quoted in the previous uh, uh, panel session about um, uh, an accident on the A9, and the FOI shows that uh, the police only reported, this is what the FOI shows, I'm just clarifying that, um, only reported that to Bear Scotland, and, uh, and the incident um, was, uh, uh, photographic evidence shows that the incident was that there was a, um, a lorry with simply a tarpaulin over it, and I stress it was photographic evidence, it wasn't, um, you know, which I've been shown. So I wonder if there's any comment in view of the amount of mortalities about if we've got it right and if not, how we should change it. 
So um, CEPA doesn't regulate the animal byproducts order, um, but we certainly regulate the transportation of waste. Mm -hmm. um, and in respect to um, the mortalities, um, now that there is no longer a, der a derogation for disposal at landfill sites, um, we are concerned. So uh, a previous question around um, concerns around the, the level and volume. Um, the uh, facilities that they're receiving these um, uh, dead fish are uh, licensed by ourselves under different pieces of legislation and quite concerned to ensure that uh, when they arrive that they're not then giving rise to problems within the locality. Um, like any other waste stream, uh, particularly organic wastes. Um, so there is, an, and we will be exploring in more detail with the industry, um, because we license on the basis of environmental impact, uh, concerned that the numbers uh, are then lend not lending out to the product in which they are being licensed for, uh, and the sustainability of that from an environmental perspective, together with the transportation and then the ongoing issues uh, that may then present themselves at further flung locations. Uh, and the nature of organic waste transportation is any delay uh, can then give rise to a problem at the point of receipt, um, and clearly that is that that this part of that wider focus. Um, in terms of our regulatory approach now, which is to look at the entirety of a sector, uh, in this case the fin fish sector, uh, and looking at all avenues in which we regulate it to ensure that there is full compliance down that line. Uh, that is the discussions that we're having at the present time and that we will be uh, continuing to have um, as we move into the sector-based uh, regulatory approach uh, that we're doing underneath our regulatory strategy. And just before anyone else comes in if they want to, could I just ask you for the record how the dead fish are disposed of? So there are um, uh, waste energy from waste facilities that do receive that material, so anaerobic digestion plants that receive it. Uh, they are further flung, so one of the key things is identifying a proximity solution um, for a range of organic wastes. Um, and I think you know um, that that is a, an essential part of the discussions that we're having. Mm, thank thank you. you. Is, it, is there any other comment on that question? Yes. Um, you're interested in what happens in terms of the environmental, in, you know, the environmental aspects of the waste. Um, there's a report by Zero Waste Scotland in 2017 that uh, I don't know if you've seen it. But it, it looks in. Essentially, it says that this waste is actually quite valuable because of the lipids and the proteins that are in it. It's actually high quality lipids and proteins, and it, it identifies roots in which the, pro uh, the products can be used, um, even in um, areas of uh, pharmaceuticals. Right, and, and uh, thank you for that. I didn't know about that. Um, but also in terms of the actual transportation, is that anything within your remit? Um, uh, that transportation, no. That, that you have concern about? Or can you make oh, sorry, we, well, we are, we're concerned for sure that um, the transport needs to be contained, um, you know, from the spillage point of view and by How security. should it be contained? Sorry? How should it be contained? It should be contained to prevent... Um, no, in what, what, you know, is, is, a, is a truck with a tarpaulin okay. over the top acceptable? Uh, there's no... What, generally speaking, as regulators, we don't specify... I mean, this is my, this isn't my area of regulation, okay. but... So the, whose area would it be? I, I'm not trying to quiz you. I'm trying to, I mean, I just want to find out whose area would it be, because there has been concern expressed about this environmental aspect of it, of spillages and 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 that. Can I? Uh, I, I do you know? The answer is I don't know. But my suspicion is that it might well fall to um, either the roads authority, as a local authority, um, or the or the trunk roads. Um, is that, sorry, for me, come in. Um, the animal um, byproduct regulations are enforced by the Animal and Plant Health um, Inspectorate. Um, and in respect to the transportation, um, like any um, organic wastes, you would expect certain levels of containment um, from an environmental perspective, concerned <coughs> about the potential in that particular scenario that you uh, made reference to, uh, Ms Beamish, around uh, discharge into watercourses and the ongoing issues mm -hmm. that might present. Uh, but in terms of animal byproducts, is the animal and plant health that are the inspectorate 
purely because it is an animal byproduct. In any other context, it would be duty of care, um, and under the Environmental Protection Act, fall to uh, waste legislation controls, uh, which would be SEPA. But it, it, there is a lead authority purely because it is an animal byproduct, and that is not ourselves, but uh, another agency. Rosco wants to come in briefly. It seems that the issue of transportation of ever growing numbers of dead salmon is, is really a symptom of, of a wider problem. So can I come back to the issue of salmon mortality again? And can I ask Rob Reynard, what is an acceptable level of salmon mortality within a salmon production system? Uh, we've seen figures referred to in the previous session of 4%, 40%. From a fish health perspective, what do you see as an acceptable level for a production system? Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't think we can identify what is a desirable or acceptable level. It's forty percent um, acceptable. It depends what's driving the cause. How whether that's a recent change. Whether that's uh, what are the industry doing about it. I think the context is critical, and I do know genuinely that the. The recent increase, as I said before, is, is largely driven by environmental factors. And industries, including those in Norway, are joining forces with Scotland to actually understand what those are and what the solution is. It's not something that we uh, like, nobody likes, and, but people are quite concerted in the way that they're approaching it. And it's an international approach to solving it. There is the, there's a, a, an international group called the Gill Health Initiative. They meet annually. Uh, it's industry, researchers, regulators. They actually look at how the science has moved on, what's causing this, what are the solutions. And we heard some of those solutions from David this morning. Um, and, and those types of fora are where you know, best practice is developed to tackle that. So. If, if the industry has a high mortality and nothing's done about it, is that acceptable? No. Um, if, if they're uh, tackling it and, and it's uh, driven down, is that a good thing? Well, that is a good thing. Um, it was can mentioned before that other livestock can industries have mortality can I, issues. Can I bring so you, you, you mentioned there about context. The context of this inquiry is that the government and industry want to double production by 2030. Mm. Do you believe that salmon mortality will go up or down if we double production as a percentage terms? And what do you see as an acceptable level of salmon mortality? Is it acceptable okay. that a quarter of the fish die before they go to market? Just to clarify a point, the Aquaculture Industry Leadership Group um, identified the target. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, support the target um, if it's reached sustainably. Um, and that is the question. So would we support uh, a doubling of production with, with such a high mortality? Um, you know, that's, a, that's a more difficult thing to say. But I, what, what, what was coming out from the discussion this morning was that um, the, the industry will need to uh, address these mortality issues in order to be able to expand. So is it being reached, is that target being reached sustainably at the moment? Um, Given the mortality levels that we have. I think, I think mortality levels at a certain level, given that it depends, if the mortality is having an environmental impact, then it's an environmental issue. But a lot of the mortality at the moment isn't having a big environmental aspect and is more of an economic sustainability and in terms of economic sustainability that is more for companies to address. So just to quantify this, let's come at this from another direction to assist the line of questioning Mr Ruskell's developing. How does the fish mortality rate in Scottish aquaculture compare to aquaculture elsewhere? Take Norway for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Norway uh, are currently experiencing mortalities, um, mortality events in the region of about 20%, which it, the, the long-term average in Scotland uh, was around 20%, and it's, it's, it's gone up uh, recently, 
uh, largely through these gill health environmental issues and the associated treatments to tackle that. But the mortality, um, the mortality in Norway is also uh, something that the industry and regulators are keen to tackle, as they are in Scotland. So we're not saying it's acceptable. But we and were told just, last just, week that there was there was considerably more investment in science taking place in Norway than there is here to to look at these issues. Is that the case? By and large, that that is the case. Um, and we often the, the the techniques and technologies that are developed in Norway are often transferred across into Scotland and Ireland and indeed you know Canada and, and Chile and I mentioned the things like the Gill Health initiative which brings um, industry and scientists and regulators from across uh, the sector the international sector together uh, to share best practice um, I think the everybody wants to drive the mortality down and in terms of what the government's doing through its um, through the development of the uh, farm fish uh, strategic health framework is the, th the right thing to do, bring everybody together and tackle this uh, cohesively. Okay, uh, just to wrap up this section, Richard Lyle briefly. Yeah, uh, in my mind's eye, I'm getting a picture of uh, dead fish on a lorry, swirling about in the road, uh, depositing uh, liquid on the road. Surely that is not the case. Surely we have uh, in a container, a skip, a big um, self-contained um, lorry that doesn't leak on the road. Surely that's the case. Or, am I wrong? Yeah, yeah you're right. I mean, sometimes uh, tankers can be used and, you know, tankers are very sealed. Um, I guess it comes down to the availability of um, vehicles at the time. But it's not. That's no. Um, that's no excuse for not uh, complying with what's required yeah. of the why, regulation. Why can't it be handled on the site? Uh, if, if fish are dying locally mm -hmm. at a site and at a fish farm, why can't the fish farm? Is it because people are saying it's got to go to a certain place, or is it because the, the facilities are not there, or is it because they're uh, not invested yeah. in something that they could, re, you know? do something with the, mm. the, the fish? So there are kind of small biodigesters that are available to put in into sites. Uh, I think the pro that, that, that can deal with, in most, like most cases, you know, the small mortalities that uh, are almost inevitable. But these large-scale mortalities, they are of such volume that they really have to be dealt with off-site. Um, there's, there's the maintenance of... Um, of a digester, for example, that could handle 150,000 fish would be huge, but it would only, might only be needed on a site once every five or six years, if that. So it's, it's about the, the costs and benefits. Thank and proportionality. You. Thank you. Very briefly. Just One is that we saw the BBC following lorries along, along narrow roads. We, um, stuff coming at the back of them on the roads and whatever so you know we've seen that that transportation of the dead fish is not what should be but could i pick up on the point you made mr reynard but you seem to say that that having all these dead fish did not have any kind of impact on the environment it was simply an impact an economic impact i mean that would be would that not be stretching it a bit surely there is there is, with that level of mortality, and there is an environmental impact, there's then what the companies are doing to try and tackle stuff like sea lice. So is it not a big leap of faith to say that there is no environmental impact of fish farming and, and the fact that 25% that, that of fish farmed are, are basically being killed because of disease? Yeah, yeah a clarification. I guess there will be some environmental impacts, but what I was trying to put her forward was that in terms of disease, um, because the mortalities are removed on a regular basis, the, the environmental risk from the disease is minimized, and then it becomes, as you say, um, 
the environmental aspects of the logistics or the loss, the loss of um, biological production um, by the business, which has had environmental input to, to generate. Um, there is that, that aspect to it. So yes, you, there, there is an environmental aspect. You. Yeah. Just quickly, um, perhaps just, just, just to put that in a, in a more grand package that hasn't been mentioned so far, most fish farm uh, planning applications come in as they're considered to be um, uh, environmental impact assessment applications to, to, to cover that ground um, and come in with an environmental statement. Um, I think I'm right in saying that most environmental statements will include a short section on disposal of, of mortalities. I suspect, uh, certainly in my mind now, that may, maybe that's an area that um, uh, planning authorities just need to put a little bit more emphasis on, or indeed the applicants need to put a bit more emphasis on um, to cover these questions, because these questions really shouldn't, shouldn't be existing um, it, if it's a, a, a feature of the farm uh, in, in its production then it is an, the, at least the impact on the road is an environmental impact that needs to be addressed. And perhaps in that context, identifying a location for the disposal of these fish as well, picking up on Anne Anderson's point. I think you probably need to go that far, yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, let, let, let's look at the discharge of medicines into the marine environment. John Scott. A quick question for CIPRA, uh, for Anne uh, Anderson. Um, can you tell the committee about the recent work you've done around the um, environmental quality standards for emectin benzoate and where do we go from here? Um, so, uh, CIPA, um, Emma Mectin benzoate has been operating to an environmental quality standard that was set a number of years ago. Um, and uh, in respect to uh, the recent work that we've done, we commissioned a DES-based study uh, of all the available intel uh, in respect to emomect and benzoate. Um, that concluded that the and recommended a tighter environmental quality standard. Um, that uh, particular uh, piece of work is uh, going to the UK Technical Advisory Group. This is a, a body that is set up under WFD, um, which uh, use, utilises the principles um, under the environment, uh, European Union directives to ensure that there is um, you know, consistency in the setting of environmental quality standards. So that particular report is, is going to the UK TAG body um, for a peer review exercise, as, as is common with any scientific document. Um, and uh, out, the, out from that particular process, do we expect to get um, a response to the body of, of work that's been commissioned to date? Uh, the intent then is for it to be provided to Scottish Government, uh, which again is consistent <laughs> with environmental quality standards under WFD and receive a Scottish Government direction for the use of that standard. In the interim period, uh, we have information um, that lends itself for a tighter control of emomect and benzoate and have put into place a position statement which uh, accommodates the current situation up to the time uh, when that uh, piece of work is concluded. Um, the focus and protection is at the precautionary end in respect to all new applications where there is a marine protected area or a priority marine feature identified through that planning and application process. Uh, where there are um, features that are believed and identified in, in the process, where emomect and benzoate may impact, that tighter standard is being adopted uh, and is placed in respect to that uh, measurement and usage of. Um, so at the present time, uh, we're uh, that process is, is underway. Um, it's moving through to the UK tag uh, in the, over the course of the next uh, month. Uh, and then we, we're, we're waiting for the output from that particular piece of work. Uh, we utilise the best available um, information um, and we then identify where uh, we, we, we need to employ that stricter standard and certainly in, the, in this case we have done so in areas where emomect and benzo has not been utilised before uh, and specifically where we have a, a crustacean population or sediment population of concern. Um, thank you and can I just ask you as well generally about should sediment quality be incorporated into 
Marine Scotland locational guidelines, as suggested by Professor Tett last week, <coughs> and all of you, perhaps. Um, so we use, in terms of the um, assessment process, there is a locational um, guideline document that we use. Um, we also use the additional information to hand. So there's a range of uh, different packages of information. Uh, clearly, having it all within the one uh, frame would be, a, would be a step forward. It would be a positive improvement. Um, the, the overall assessment of cumulative impacts uh, and spatial locations is an area that um, I'm certainly um, very keen to explore with other regulators, and we've been discussing um, that aspect um, and addressing, because there are, as I think I identified last week, there are gaps in the information, um, and uh, ability to fill those gaps is, is key. I'm going to bring Mark Roscoe in a minute to, to with a supplementary question and to, to move this on into the issue of nutrients. But can I just pick up on the more general issue of marine protected areas and protected features? Um, the report indicates in 2003 there were 16 salmon farms sited above Merrill Beds. We've learned since that there are currently 25 located within MPAs that are designated for Merrill Beds. We are also told that two years of following does not allow recovery of beds. Why on earth are we allowing salmon farms anywhere near these features? So, in respect to um, the, the information available at the time, we do um, a baseline assessment um, that is undertaken and we utilise the information available uh, from other bodies. Um, so every application is assessed on a range of environmental factors. Um, in respect to the marl beds, um, there are uh, recorded in and around the reference stations. Uh, reference stations are out with of the zone of the actual impact, so they're the baseline uh, set aside. Um, and uh, the, in terms of that uh, available data, uh, we have got uh, rec recognised information that forms part of the key aspects of a planning of the car application process. Uh, the need to do that baseline and seabed assessment and provide that information at that stage to identify whether or not there is a marine <coughs> protected feature uh, present, and in this case, mar marl beds. Um, so, sorry, in layman's terms, do we have? Um, fish farms located sufficiently close to Merrill beds within these MPAs where they could be having an impact. Is that happening or isn't it? So the information I have is that there are 29 um, sites which are currently um, recorded in or, or, or positioned in, a record, in or around areas where marl beds are present. Um, of those 29, marl has not been recorded to be present recently at 13 of those facilities, so the answer would be yes, there are. Uh, in and around the location of and the identification of that. These are uh, existing and ongoing um, facilities. So they're having a detrimental effect on the metal beds? I am, um, I can, I don't, in terms of that, I, it's a, the facts I have is simply that there have been recorded presence of marl. There is now currently 13 um, recorded to be present at this time period. Um, and that's in respect to, to recent information. Right. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Do you think there should be a phase out on the use of emamectin? And if so, over what time scale? Um, SIPA has undertaken a reduction in the use of emamectin. A uh, blanket um, variation applied to all active and, and closed um, operating fish farms. Um, so those operating currently and those that could operate in the next cycle. Uh, that restricted the total quantity of use of the medicine. Um, the environmental quality standard, the tighter environmental quality standard itself, um, the, the position and the assessment point hasn't changed. Uh, that in itself will require a reduction in the use of emamectin benzoate by default. Do you think that could lead to a ban on its use? Um, I think that, you know, in terms of the decision and the output, there I'm aware that there are additional research um, being undertaken at the present term in terms of the ecotoxicity of emamectin <coughs> benzoate. So I referred to a death study that was, uh, was undertaken based on laboratory information. Uh, there is uh, a proposal and a research project underway uh, which tries to minimise, uh, to um, mimic um, as best the marine environment. 
Um, so the output from that will um, obviously add to uh, the science in this area. It continues, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we, as a regulator, um, keep informed and react to that um, changing um, scientific um, information. Okay. Um, and if I could turn to nutrients, I mean, you, you heard the last panel on their reflections on the new uh, DZR regulation which SEPA uh, are putting forward, but you also would have heard some concern about the lack of scientific evidence to underpin that. Um, wh wh where do you see the DZR regulation going, and should it not expand perhaps to all fish farms? Why has there been an approach on only looking at expansions in more exposed locations? Why not the entire industry? I'm, I'm, I don't understand this. So um, the DZR consultation um, has closed. We're currently reviewing. Uh, we received 144 uh, pieces of information and um, from a range of stakeholders, both industry, communities, and uh, other regulatory bodies. Um, Part of the approach is in respect to the transition, so the introduction of a new regulatory approach to fish farming. Um, I would envisage that being a transition across the entirety of the fish farm licence process. DZR introduces uh, additional monitoring. Um, it, uh, it adds to the information base. Um, it also is an approach that allows um, what is, has been referred to as adaptive management. There's an element of that under the current uh, CAR environmental licence uh, controls, and it's how SEPA as a regulator works, is to take the evidence and then to pull back and, and undertake uh, an action if um, it's not predicting the environmental impact that was expected. Um, so DZR is actually providing and will provide a greater level of monitoring a greater level of evidence um, and for us then to be able to assess against that and for the business then to adapt within its uh, zone of impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Claudia Beamish, I think, is a supplementary before we move on to COIs. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, could I come back to you, please, um, Anne Anderson, and ask you um, in relation to MPAs um, whether um, you've highlighted melbeds, whether in relation to either melbeds or any other um, protected feature, um, there is any regulation opportunity, if thought necessary, to actually stop the activities of a fish farm if it's environmentally effect affecting um, uh, a, 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 an area um, which is protected, and how would, what would that process be if, if it exists? So as part of the um, CAR consenting regime, and I will provide details of that particular process to you, so I'll do my best just to summarise that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, CEPA is a competent authority in terms of Natura. Uh, we undertake a habitat impact assessment and we also consult with SNH. Um, to ensure that we've got the accuracy of the information. Part of that is to ensure that where we are permitting, um, that that permit is in compliance with that wider range of environmental information. Um, so the habitat impact assessment is done in those instances, um, and specifically with the view, as we do on land-based activities with um, uh, SSSI, uh, processes, the same level of protection is provided. Uh, recently, with the MMX and Benzo, we extended that to include priority marine features, as we recognised um, the species uh, rather than the fixed place. Uh, and identification of a species within an area uh, was particularly important, given it was a medicine thing. So, in terms of the uh, uh, the controls that we put into play that does form part of that assessment process uh, and is something that has become more, um, more self-evident over uh, the recent years. Um, some of the facilities we referred to earlier are facilities that have been established for quite some period of time, um, early stages, if you like, of the FinFAR. Uh, sorry. I, I still don't understand um, in your answer, um, in terms of what I asked, is there the possibility if um, there how is it monitored once it's happening? And is there the possibility of stopping um, activity if there is shown to be a detrimental environmental effect? And if so, what is that process? Okay. Uh, in terms of the seabed monitoring, we set a limit in terms of benthic, uh, and that's based on uh, the information that's present at the time of the application. In respect to MPAs, there is that assessment that's undertaken under the, um, the habitat uh, impact assessment process. Um, 
that's a, that's a body of work under Natura legislation. Um, then any non-compliance with the Benthix requires additional seabed monitoring. So um, most commonly, do we have video evidence um, of the seabed underneath? So there's a stage approach um, that's, that's then taken uh, in that process. And clearly, if there is an impact, we have uh, the ability then to adjust and or um, uh, revoke licenses. So there any examples of licenses being revoked in those circumstances? I'm not familiar with, but I will check and ensure. We certainly do reduce the quantity of impact from farms when we have had failing Benthix. It's a very common approach as a regulator to, to pull back. I'm not aware of the specifics of that, but I will ensure that I capture that and provide So they may be scaled back in what they're allowed to do, but is what you're saying. But I'd be interested to know how often that has happened and also whether there have been instances where a licence has simply been revoked because of the impact that was identified. Yeah, I'm not familiar with one that has been revoked, um, but I will provide you with that, the accuracy okay, in the thank detail. Thank you. Yeah. Claudia, we must do it on CYs. And indeed, if there is the power to do so, to revoke. Yeah, thank you. Right, so if we could move to CLAS, um, and I'd just like to highlight from the SAMS report, um, for the record, as I did last week, that um, sea lice um, are a key impediment to the expansion of the Scottish salmon farming industry in the marine environment. And that's the scientific um, research, that peer-reviewed research that we commissioned as a, as a committee. Um, you will have heard today the, um, the announcement by David Sanderson, I, I, I think, about... Um, the real-time public uh, reporting of sea lice data, which was something that was um, brought forward but not accepted in the Aquaculture um, Bill, which, of course, is now an act um, over, <coughs> over five years now. Um, do, do you have any comments, any of you, from your perspective uh, on the situation in terms of real-time reporting and if there are benefits to the reporting being um, publicly available, and uh, if, if those are in relation to either disease or research, that would be very helpful. Um, I think uh, any uh, publication of information in this area is really important um, for ability to be transparent. Um, SEPA um, publishes on Scottish Aquaculture website information that we receive. Um, and any aspect um, then is something that uh, any access for any particular uh, R&D work. Uh, so it is a definite, a, a beneficial move um, that the industry have chosen to do. Um, and I think uh, the, the information around uh, sea, lice, um, sea lice mapping and locations um, re relate to, I mentioned earlier about the interdependencies. Um, so being in better informed can only be a good thing going forward. All right, so just before we move on, I should have also posed the question um, to you, um, Anne Anderson, about whether, um, in your view, or do you have a view as to whether that should be um, a legislative requirement of the industry? I think if it is consistently provided, um, that's the key point. Um, uh, what, as a, if, if we believe that there is a need for it, I think a regulatory control it requires that to be then applied, as, as I think was pointed out, uh, the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation don't represent the entirety of Scottish industry. And I think it is relevant, given that we're talking about the entirety of the impact on an industry in Scottish waters, that all that information is available at the one time to, to add weight to the to the to R and T R and D work. Yeah. Are there further comments from the panel on that particular aspect could, of the sea lice issue? Could I could I come in? Uh, just to just to say it's it's very welcome um, publication of the data. Um, I suppose I speak obviously because we represent that local democratic and public public accessibility to our work is is is. Uh, is, is part of our day to day. I think it uh, could make a very big change to um, our, our work because um, it's always been a frustration that information about sea lice numbers were uh, difficult to come across, certainly on a on a site by site basis. Um, if that's to be available, I think one can expect to see a great deal more, more public comment upon it. 
and uh, certainly we as a local authority are going to have to be uh, ready to uh, be able to uh, <laughs> handle that comment. Um, the other point I wanted to make, of course, is it, it, um, it effectively answers one of the questions that our um, use of environmental management plan conditions has been aimed at achieving, which was to allow the authority uh, access to site information, uh, site-specific information on sea lice. Um, and because of sensitivity about FOI and so forth, we were having to work, try and work out uh, arrangements to receive that information on a face-to-face -face basis, so there wasn't an exchange of information. Um, hopefully that will not now be necessary, um, and that will allow the focus of the EMP to become, um, to, to move much more onto the issue of wild fish monitoring, which is the, the, other, the other aspect of it. Um, so I think that that openness, you know, within within the planning system is is just a good thing. Full stop. It should be statutory, um, because that allows regulators such as myself to be able to rely on it without mm -hmm. getting into uh, unnecessary arguments and and, and costly uh, uh, requests for further information and so forth. Mm -hmm. Are there further comments on that? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think I think uh, good access to data is important for the research um, and the provision of advice from that research regarding planning, etc. I think it's not just about real time. I, could, I, I can see that real time might be of interest to local authorities, etc. Um, often, from a research perspective, one is looking at long-term data sets, mm -hmm. and you want to be able to compare fish data with sea lice data. So having um, availability to historic data is also mm -hmm. quite important strategically. Um, I mean, our approach at the moment is to be to work in collaboration with the industry on the availability of data. Um, to a large extent, that's worked quite well, but uh, there have been occasions where it's, uh, as, as, as Mark has mentioned, where it's, it's a bit more difficult. Um, uh, it, there's the work in the, in addition to what David has said, that is being focused on in the uh, fish health, farm fish strategic framework group, availability of data in general. Uh, and so, you know, I guess we don't mind how the data is made available, but it seems that that um, availability is improving. Right, thank you. And, and I've got, um I have three other questions about sea lice. I'm going to ask them all at once, and please do not feel an obligation to answer if, if it's not um, within your, your, your scope, obviously. Um, I'd like to know, um, Mark Harvey's already touched on um, the potential wild salmonoid impacts um, of sea lice, and, uh, and I would like to know whether there's a view on removing that from planning into a separate regulatory process would be um, something that's being considered and is it of any value in your view? Um, how is the duty under the Nature Conservancy Scotland Act 2004 discharged with respect to salmon farming? Um, and that is, as you will know, but for the record that all public bodies are required to further the conservation of biodiversity. And finally, are there any comments on the appropriateness of the triggers um, in relation to sea lice for the reporting mechanism. Uh, and so I would just open that up to <coughs> panel members, please. Maybe I can kick off with the, the last element of your question about the appropriateness of, of the triggers. Um, essentially, yes, for the first time we have um, a need to report sea lice above a certain level. It's an average of three uh, female lice per fish. Um, and, and then there's another level, uh, which is a statutory intervention level of eight. Uh, how appropriate are they? I think when one looks at the purpose for what they're designed to do, which is to enable the industry to avoid the occasions where big peaks occur, then they, they are appropriate. The basis for that is the, both through discussions with industry's own experience of where lice have got out of control, 
uh, on individual farms that keeping lice uh, below three is a very important level. And where the lice get above three, there's obviously increased risk that numbers escalate on a farm without um, a, a plan in place. So the new measures allow the plan to be put in place, the fish health inspectors to monitor the outputs of that plan and uh, to take enforcement action uh, should that not deliver the results. Um, so could I just ask you on that, that? I understand that the SAMS report says that there's no published scientific account of the basis of the setting of the trigger levels in the new sea lice policy. So uh, could you clarify for us how those were decided? Yeah, and so why do they differ from the code of practice levels? So it's not, you're correct, it's not published. Right. Um, the, the level of three fits with the, um, we, we did some uh, analysis, the long-term analysis of the data that industry provides through the SSPO's reporting areas. When that is um, modeled, uh, three emerges as the kind of upper mean level, which indicates that you know most of the industry is staying uh, at, an, at an acceptable level. The requirement of the law is to have measures in place for the prevention, control, and reduction of sea lice, and demonstrating that the measures are in place, we felt uh, was indicated by um, whether one could stay below three or not. The, so the, that, that graph that I spoke about um, fits with, with the decision to make three. It's not, it's not based on pure science, if you sort of mean. I mean, that really is a kind of adaptive approach. And we've agreed to, it's obviously bedding in, uh, we've agreed to review that after 12 months, which will be July this year. And the analysis that we've made of, this, of the industry data, what we've got there is a Scottish model uh, that we were, we were about to publish on that. So unfortunately, it wasn't available for Sam, who so focused on the peer-reviewed literature. It will be published very soon. And that's showing that um, the seasonally adjusted level, sea lice go up and down uh, based on season. And um, the seasonally adjusted level at the moment is the lowest it's been uh, for the past three years. So it's, it's come down over three years from about an average national level of 2.5 to around about one. So that's one average uh, female louse per fish as a national average. But of course, the measures we've got in place are aimed at ensuring that individual farms don't lose control. Right, thank you. Are, are oh, sorry, any... I, I should point out that the, yes. the um, SSPO's code of good practice numbers of 0 0.4 and 1 are, aren't, aren't limits that are set by either the SSPO or ourselves. They are the level at which um, veterinary uh, mm. intervention should mm -hmm. be consulted. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. So yeah. are there, very briefly, any comments on the other questions from yourself or anyone else on the panel? I'll, I'll come just, again, planning authority views slightly different. You've mentioned the biodiversity duty. The biodiversity duty is very much in planning authorities at the forefront of their minds mm -hmm. when it comes to the protection of wild fish in, in respect of, of sea lice. That's really where we, we continue to emphasise that we need to show in taking a positive planning decision that we are addressing that biodiversity duty um, as well as we possibly can. There, there's room for debate there. Uh, this discussion of triggers, um, well, probably the, your first and your third question from my point of view come together there. Discussion of triggers probably is a, is a good example of why this, these matters are best left in the, in the planning realm, not exclusively, but I think it's important that there's local control <coughs> because it seems to me that, that this assessment must be site by site. Um, in our own area, we have um, SAC rivers, so that these are protected rivers, some of them protected <coughs> because they represent uh, important um, uh, salmonid uh, breeding areas, some of them because they contain freshwater pearl mussel populations which rely on salmonids to distribute uh, the young um, 
uh, muscles and, and continue the, uh, uh, that, that process. Clearly, when we're looking at a planning decision, therefore, there are sites of greater and lesser sensitivity. And I think it would be you know, appropriate, therefore, that we're applying tighter and perhaps less tight uh, uh, control on <coughs> pardon me, uh, control on, on, uh, on sea lice numbers, potentially. So I think, I think a one um, regulation or one set f figure that um, suits all is, is not necessarily um, uh, uh, appropriate. Um, I, I've got, we, we can move on, actually, uh, uh, to, to, to perhaps the issue of wild fish at, at, at a later point. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other comment? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Richard Lyle. Yeah, Convener, I've got actually got two questions. I'll try and be brief. Um, there is a desire to double our salmon production, but we have, as I see it, amongst others, two problems. 20% fish mortality, over 20% in fish escapes. Over 2 million fish have escaped in the last 15 years. OK, people may say, oh, it's only 147,000 a year but it's 147,000 too much. So does a fish farm face any uh, regulation consequences if fish escape, and do they report escapees to anyone at present? Um, yeah, so uh, reports of escapees are provided to fish health inspectors. Uh, there's a requirement in the Aquaculture and Fisheries Act for businesses to report um, an escape or even suspicion of an escape. Um, there's a requirement to, for farmers to have in place um, measures to pr prevent uh, and control um, escapes as well. And following an escape, uh, fish health inspectors uh, will, in, will visit the farm and investigate whether or not they consider um, best practice in relation to containment um, had occurred. At the moment, um, much, of, much of the inspection uh, is focused on the elements of the code of good practice, which is considered to be best practice, plus uh, record keeping elements that are, are required by statute. Um, and as it was mentioned before, I think David Sanderson mentioned that the uh, there's an in development of an industry, not an industry, a Scottish um, containment standard that could become part of that in the future um, to make things more robust. So the, the inspectors um, will take any enforcement action uh, dependent on you know, what they find. So they find? Sorry? Are they find? Or is it just a, oh, no. you, no, uh, no, you no, lost fish, so there's, there's try no, and do better the next time? No, there's, there's no fine for escapes in Scotland. Um, there's the, the measures that are in place under the Act are that um, an enforcement notice can be issued, um, and that's uh, obviously um, not complying with an enforcement notice is a criminal offence, but the... Many of the um, issues that are found um, are dealt with through um, written correspondence. So no one's taken to court? No. OK, I'll move on. Um, Notification to assist on that line of questioning. The, the 140-odd thousand uh, fish every year that we know escape, yeah. is that indicative of a widespread problem or is it largely made up of a number of relatively small incidents of large, a small number of large-scale escapes? Yeah, the, the, the large-scale escapes tend to be associated with extreme storms, mm -hmm. often storms where people actually end up dying in Scotland, which is, you know, we don't want any of that to happen, but occasionally it does. Um, I mean, the data for the last uh, three months is uh, there were five escapes reported. Uh, one had six, one had about 1,600. Two had zero because they were suspicion. They reported suspicion of escape. So that would be, um, you know, maybe a small hole because the mm -hmm. nets are frequently inspected. Maybe a small hole is found, and and that's reported as a suspicion. And another one was 500. 
So it's pretty varied. It, it is varied, yeah. And so there's quite a lot of incidents then based on what you've said to us. Small amount, small amount, but uh, wide varied. OK. Um, what monitoring and research is taking place to understand levels in, in, of introgression in Scotland? Does more need to be done in this area? Um, yeah, I can maybe continue with that one. Um, uh, Marine Scotland is ex ex exploring the development of a regular system to, of national assessment for introgression. One of the challenges, there has been research looking at integration in Scotland. Uh, it's reported in the SAMS report. But one of, what's not mentioned in the SAMS report is that something that's hindered the research has been the, the past practice. It doesn't happen now, but historically, some farmed fish were deliberately released um, for restocking purposes into some rivers. Yeah. And those genes, because those genes are present, from historic, it's not really anything related to escapes. Because they're there historically, it means that the tools, the genetic tools that have to be developed um, are much more difficult to do so. But Marine Scotland have um, an assessment in place to look at that. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Lyle. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Um, a very quick question with a quick answer, I suspect. Um, do the government and any of the regulators have a role in uh, uh, regulating farmed salmon food? Nope, I got a shaking head there. Oh, sorry, Ms. Anderson. Uh, under, uh, dependent on the scale and size of the feed processing plant, uh, we do have feed processing plants in Scotland that are required to have a permit under pollution prevention control legislation. And there are uh, areas within that that pertain to raw materials and resource efficiency. Uh, would that address the issue of sustainability and uh, influence the balance between uh, uh, sea-based product and uh, vegetable product? Um, it certainly allows the potential to have those discussions. Um, to date, they haven't uh, taken that route because it has largely been a resource efficiency issue around energy and water and, and, um, and other materials. But in terms of our approaches going forward, it, it will be featuring. Right. So we have the powers. We're not yet using them. Right. Moving on. Um, the report we uh, have as a committee says a number of things. And I'll just read out the list. Uh, additional regulation of shooting could improve seal welfare. Uh, e.g. through the reintroduction of closed seasons for shooting corresponding to the main nursing periods for sales, uh, validation of shooting reports and additional post-mortems on shot sales could increase the proportion of clean kills. Is there seen by any of the panel members as uh, a need to act on any of these issues? Yes. Um, in relation to the uh, shooting aspect, um, I think it's important that we always maintain a position which is clearly that the shooting regulation, if you like, the legislation was brought in to helpfully reduce it. In terms of the restrictions you would place in terms of protecting the population, yes, um, those, those facilities are available within the regulations and conditions can be applied to licences to restrict during periods of concern with respect to, say, breeding season, etc. Okay, thank you. And uh, finally, on the issue of uh, ADD noise-related pollution, um, is there a case for better monitoring and licensing? Well, um, absolutely, in the sense of uh, the interest in the subject earlier on today, one can tell from <coughs> the discussions there are quite different opinions, which makes it rather difficult sometimes to bring some sort of... Um, Common place, uh, uh, common, sorry, some common theories into place. However, the bottom line is that um, in the SAMS report identifies the necessity to do more work. We would agree with that. It's important for that to, to happen. Marine Scotland, as a, an entity, has a, a, a desire to pursue that. Um, we would work collaboratively with Scottish Natural Heritage. Um, I think that what's most important is that in making decisions on whether you want to regulate, need to regulate, is required to regulate, it has to be based on good evidence. And in doing so, we have to be able to collect it. There are pretty much pretty good bits of evidence out there, but they are quite different. So you have to be able to take a balanced view, which is really difficult in respect to making um, proportionate decisions. 
and look into what you might actually be restricting in the future if that's the route you would take. So at this point in time, um, we don't lose sight of the necessity to give it a very rigorous cons uh, consideration and would work towards trying to get yourself to a place to make a decision. Uh, who's got the lead? Is it Marine Scotland or SNH? Uh, Marine Scotland would work collaboratively with SNH, yes, very much. So SNH would be important to that decision making, as do, would others like uh, the Sea Mammal Research Unit and indeed others like Marine Sorry, Scotland. Sorry, do forgive me, who's got the lead? It would be ourselves who would presumably be able to take the lead in that. We would expect That's to do fine. so at the moment. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Keep it in. Oh yes, so, sorry. It was um, only that uh, this this issue was of ADDs was rather thrust on us in the last couple of years because um, <coughs> my my general area of work is sky, and the water surrounding sky are now a mm. candidate SAC for harbour porpoise, so it immediately became a much more important material consideration for us. Our response to that is actually to put a condition on uh, any any permission granted that. Um, requires the operator to retain a, a log of ADD use. But actually, more importantly, uh, uh, and above that, um, through discussion with SNH, um, because SNH obviously are also faced with a situation where retrospectively they may need to look at the, the use of existing ADDs on existing farms uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, potentially take action in, in, t in terms of um, uh, requiring adjustments to the way in which they're used. Um, as a result of that, we, we've also been looking at uh, whether um, particular equipment can be tuned, because obviously we're talking about sound frequencies underwater here, whether it can be tuned to uh, affect um, seals, um, but not, of course, affect harbour porpoise and indeed other cetaceans, uh, which is a, a similar problem. So at both the planning application stage and subsequently through the compliance of the condition. We are trying to control this one because obviously the existence of an SAC uh, makes it a pressing issue for I, us. I don't want to open up a huge subject, but presumably you were monitoring noise at the uh, torpedo range adjacent to Sky, which is adjacent to the SAC anyway. Uh, yes, although we, we're not feeding that information. That's we're not right. trying to feed that information at the moment. Commander Roscoe. I'd like to ask Mr. McKee about the uh, regulations that we have in place which allow the killing of seals in Scotland. <coughs> now, my understanding is that this falls foul of the United States Marine Mammal Protection Act, which, quoting the Act, prohibits the intentional killing or serious injury of marine animals, mammals in all fisheries. And as a result of that, we could be facing an export ban not just on Scottish salmon, but indeed all of our fisheries products in four years. Can, can you tell us what Marine Scotland is doing to try and address this situation? Are you, for example, looking at withdrawing that regulation which allows the uh, intentional killing of seals, or are you lobbying Mr Trump to try and change the regulations? Yeah, thank you. Um, the position is, is at the moment, um, in, in relation to how we are tackling it uh, directly, is that's a matter which is being dealt with by part of Marine Scotland, indeed in a wider part of Scottish Government, to understand exactly what it means in terms of what's required, what the expectations are, and then from there, that will then feed back into how we then react from a regulatory perspective. So we don't yet know exactly in, uh, where we are going with that. So how much concern is there around this? Because the words in the US Act are any regime which um, allows the intentional killing or serious mm. injury. So intentional killing is what we actually have in mm. relation to SEALs. Mm. We have a license regime for that. Yeah. Um, whether serious injury caused by ADDs or mm. other mm. Uh, techniques which may scare uh, away marine mammals is another question. But I think it's quite clear we've got intentional mm. killing. Mm. <laughs> It, it, obviously, I uh, have to say that from my perspective, clearly I'm at the sharp end. There's people who are sitting behind that. Um, and it is a case of, it is a concern. Yes, it is a concern. It's been treated as a concern. And discussions are underway uh, to try to verify and consider exactly what it means. And then, obviously, that will then help the feed into the decisions going forward. What's the time scale for that? Um, because if the salmon industry loses mm -hmm. the US market, I would imagine that's pretty chunky. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that point. I don't know the answer to that, um, but clearly that's something we would 
need to come back on from could, time to could time. The committee, still. Could you write back to course, the on that yes. through the chair? Yeah, yep. That would be useful. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Finlay Carson. Given the likely increase in the use of RAS as a cleaner fish, is, is there any need for additional regulation uh, of the, the well fisheries to deal with any impact? Uh, <clears throat> perhaps I can answer that. Um, yeah, so Marine Scotland's holding discussions with all stakeholders in the industry and fishermen um, as to what management needs to be put in place. We're quite obviously quite serious about needing to protect the environment with the numbers being taken out. And we know that um, the fishery in southwest England is, is managed sustainably. So what we've done already is uh, licensed the fishermen, um, required uh, data collection from landings, and that will be uh, important data that's put into uh, the management uh, subsequent management of the fishery um, and there's discussions going on you know this month um, to decide what needs to be put in place uh, before the fishery starts in April finally just on the subject of mitigation Alex Rowley the fisheries management Scotland have said that the regulation system for the salmon farming industry is unusual because there is no formal requirement for pre-application or post-consent monitoring uh, of wild fish, as there is for many other developments. Why is that the case, and does it need to change? Um, in terms of post-consent monitoring, uh, I'll go back to uh, the environmental management plans that we've um, we've started to introduce uh, in planning applications. I think that's as far as it gets. So I think the answer from a planning authority point of view is yes, we do think there's a need for post-consent uh, monitoring. Um, these are un unusual planning permissions and obviously they, you know, they, they are permanent planning permissions. They, la they last forever. But they, they obviously can go through um, different cycles. It's not like granting planning permission for a building. It's there. You know, you, you can pretty much work out what it's going to do. Um, the, these are active and consequently yes, very much um, uh, should be subject to ongoing monitoring. I, I don't claim the EMPs are the perfect tool, but they are something moving in that direction, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, and, and the final, final question from uh, John Scott. Um, thank you, uh, convener. Um, you, some, you may have heard me discuss the possibility of engineering solutions in terms of um, scooping up and gathering the detritus in below fish farms and the possible development of that to, to scoop up the waste. Um, do you think that engineering solutions are part of the answer to these deposits that are placed in seabeds that carry all the um, attendant risks, uh, that they may carry the attendant risks that we have defined thus far. So do you believe engineering solutions are the way forward? Um, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, there is a range of solutions. Um, we've heard uh, reference to complete containment, but there are many different steps up to that point. Um, and accessing through um, is, is an element that we've been particularly looking at globally. A colleague has recently come back from the Tasmanian project that um, Sam Collins referenced earlier, and that is very, around, uh, very much centred around the capturing of as much of the detritus. Yeah. So I think that definitely is something to, to, be, to be looking to the future in. Yeah. Thank you. You, Anyone else? So I was going to just pick up on that. Given that you've done that piece of work, it's obviously something you're cited on. Is has anyone looked at the point that was made in the earlier session around the increased carbon footprint of moving to close containment onshore uh, rearing of fish, set against the environmental benefits of that approach? So that's an area of work that we're looking into at the present time. I made reference to SEPA's regulatory approach at a sector level uh, for fin fish farming. Uh, so we are looking at all of its activities from the, the, the generation of that egg through to the production of the, the final product to plate. Um, and part of that is assessing uh, these new technologies and is it a substitution of another pollution problem is very much featuring um, in that assessment at the present time. 
Okay. Does anybody else want to come in on those two points, uh, Mark I, Harvey? I, I, I suppose the issue about sustainability of one environmental impact versus another is depends on how sustainably Scotland's producing its electricity. If it's to run on electricity, for example, I mean, I mean it's you know, it's a it's a it's a relevant question. It's, it's reliant upon uh, uh, on uh, on other things. Uh, it does seem to me that land-based containment uh, raises a bit of a planning problem. It, it is land hungry. These, these would be quite large installations. Um, I don't think any planning authority could guarantee that it could immediately identify uh, in, enough sites. So it, that, that also raises an environmental issue. Uh, I think it suggested in the report, if I remember correctly, that each of these sites would need effectively its own sewage treatment plant. Yes, I think that's, that's, why, they're, that's why they're energy. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, that's technically quite feasible, um, but of course, requires energy to uh, to, to yes. drive it, yes. Anne Anderson, did you want to come in that? Just to, to add in, um, there are um, some early uh, research into the use of um, research hatchery uh, wastes for the purposes of that future sustainability. Uh, recent project that SEPA is involved with in industry and other partners uh, around identifying suitable uses, sustainable uses, uh, one of those elements will be considering the detritus from that falls from the bottom of the cages. Um, so there is work underway with that very aspect in mind. Okay. I'm interested in this idea of a ladder, as it were, or, 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 you know, going from where we are to ultimately uh, land-based solutions, but uh, there's a lot of steps in between, and I think those should be investigated, I must say. That there is um, a, a range of different products that are being trialled globally. Um, certainly, discussions uh, within the Scottish scene around the usage of them. Uh, I think it is also very much locational, um, and the flexibility around uh, different solutions for different locations is absolutely fundamental to, to those conversations at the present time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you all of you for your evidence this morning. I thank the first panel as well. Um, at its next meeting on the 20th of February, the committee expects to consider a draft report on its air quality in Scotland inquiry. We will now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery is cleared as the public part of the meeting is at an end. Thank you. <laughs>